Jane Lichter, and I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 12, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Frampong. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live media broadcast and on BCPS Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the September 12th agenda. Dr. Yarbrough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I would like to defer. I would like to defer to Ms. Harvey. Ms. Harvey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to add contract MWE 801 21 modification reading intervention for secondary schools as agenda item N 9 under new business contract awards. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Young. Thank you, Mr. Young. Any discussion? May I have a roll call a discussion about adding it to the agenda? Yes. Okay. Uh, will we be discussing it once it's added? The you mean the it's contract? during contracts? Yes. Okay. 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 May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Dulusky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dreyer? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The revised agenda is approved. Thank you. Early this e earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or other officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and to our illustrious Superintendent, Dr. Rogers. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, resi retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificate appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D1? So move, Pumphrey. Do I have a second? Second, Primpong. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 through D D6? So move, Stolesky. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Frempong. Thanks. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, thank you, Mr. McCall. Sure. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. 
Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Director, Risk Management, Manager, Office of Position Management, Classification and Human Resources Information Systems, Supervisor, Career and Technical Education, Senior Supervisor, Construction, Office of Facilities, Specialist, School Improvement, Office of World Languages and ESOL, Human Resources Officer, Office of Staffing, Pupil Personnel Worker, Office of Pupil Personnel Services, and Senior Operations Sur Supervisor, Office of Transportation. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yarbrough? Thank you. Our first appointee this evening is David Andrachi. David, please uh, stand. He is attending this evening and be, is, is being appointed to the position of manager in the Office of Position Management, Classification, and Human Resources Information Systems. With almost six years of prior experience in Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include Supervisor, Office of Position Management, Fiscal Analyst 3 in the Office of Budget and Reporting. His prior experiences include operational data analysts, financial analysts, and management analysts. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment this evening is Jessica I. She is attending this evening with her children, Mason and Madison. Please stand. She's being appointed to the position of Human Resources Officer in the Office of Staffing. With 16 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include Human Resources Analyst, Administrative Assistant, Administrative Secretary in the Office of Staffing, and Administrative Secretary in the Office of Support Services. Her prior experiences include Director of Marketing, Marketing Associate, and Marketing Coordinator. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Trevor Hicks. <laughs> Trevor is attending this evening and is being appointed to the Advisor Construction in the Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement. With seven years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, his pre previous experience include Senior Project Manager and Project Manager and Assistant Project Manager. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Carly Kopeck. <laughs> Carly Kopeck is attending this evening with her husband, Joseph Kopeck, BCPS principal, <laughs> and is being appointed to the position of Specialist School Improvement Office of World Languages and ESOL. With 14 years of service outside of BCPS, Carly's experiences include English language development teacher, classroom teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. <laughs> Our next appointment is Selvina Springer Brewster. She is attending. <laughs> She's attending this evening with her husband, Jefferson <laughs> Brewster and Erica Hamlet coordinator of the Office of Pupil Personnel Services. She's being appointed to the position of pupil personnel worker. With two years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience includes school community facilitator at Martin Boulevard Elementary School. Prior to that, she was an ESOL teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools and a classroom teacher in Charles County Public Schools, Montgomery County, Prince George's, and the District of Columbia. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Renee Stout. Renee is attending this evening with her husband, Ryan Sackett, and daughter, Vivian Sackett. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> <laughs> hey. 
She's being appointed to the position of Supervisor, Career and Technical Education in the Office of Career and Technical Education and Fine Arts. With 21 years of service outside of BCPS, her previous experiences <laughs> include Assistant Principal in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, Reading and English Teacher in Anne Arundel, and Language Arts Teacher in Prince George's County Public Schools and Talbot County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Our next appointment is Ryan Trexler. <laughs> Ryan is attending this evening and is being appointed Director Risk Management in the Office of Risk Management. With almost 27 years of experience outside of BCPS, his previous experiences include Independent Consultant, Vice President of Risk and Quality, Manager of Marketing and Promotions, Senior Director and Association Director of Development. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Our final appointment this evening watching virtually is David Wright. David Wright is being appointed to the position of Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. With over 37 years experience outside of Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include Executive Vice President, Regional Director, Terminal Manager and Air Operations Supervisor. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by, by her staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board and no speaker substitutions will be allowed. Based on policy 83 of 50, 8315, which was amended on July 11th of this year, representatives from the following categories are invited to address the board during the public comment period of the board's meeting. A maximum of five spaces will be allocated in each of these categories. School system affiliated groups, unions, nonprofit community groups, and individual citizens or students. So that a diversity of viewpoints receives the opportunity to address the board when there are more requests than available spaces in any of the categories, first priority will be given to those groups or individuals who have not yet spoken during the two prior board meetings. When the space is reserved and any of the four categories are not filled, those spaces will be offered on a first come, first serve basis through the wait list sign up sheet. In accordance with recommendations from the Baltimore County Police Department, Department Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety, we have implemented the following safety and security protocols to enhance the safety of all attendees. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out in the hall to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the da dais. While we appreciate the creativity many have shown during their presentations, materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Information to be given to the board is to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other participants is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockdown, lockout, or evacuation, staff from the office of school safety will direct participants. If evacuating, participants will exit through the rear or front door in an orderly manner, leaving the building and crossing over to the parking lot or other safe distance as warranted. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it 
could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our sis school system affiliated groups to speak. And our first speaker is Claire Cabril from the Baltimore County Student Council. Good evening. Good evening, esteemed members of the Board of Education. My name is Claire Cabral, and I am a current senior at Hereford High School. This past April, I was elected as the president of the Baltimore County Student Councils, more commonly referred to as BCSE. I'm excited to be here with you tonight to share updates regarding some of our organization's initiatives and opportunities to connect with students this year. First and foremost, BCSC is excited to welcome over 30 new student members into our executive board with a variety of new positions, ranging from mental health affairs coordinators to regional representatives. These student leaders will connect with various personnel in BCPS and provide a unique student perspective that we are thrilled to share this year. We continue partnerships with our sister organization, the Baltimore County Junior Councils, or BCJC, who proudly boast a diverse board of middle school students as well from across the county. Many other secondary school students have been appointed into committee roles, ranging from student resources and wellness, to environmental, to diversity and equity, and to our SMOB Outreach Committee. We have so many amazing student leaders this school year and cannot wait for the year ahead. Furthermore, BCSE is proud to announce the first ever workshop certification program in partnership with the Maryland Association of Student Councils, which will be held on October 21st at Hereford High School. This opportunity is available to all students involved in student council in BCPS who wish to improve their leadership skills and gain certifications at the county and state level to present at student conferences. This event will serve as a model for many other counties in the state of Maryland, and we are thrilled to pilot this program. In addition, the Board of Selected Students, or BOSS, has recently opened applications for students. BOSS is a group of secondary school students who meet monthly to represent their school's viewpoints, discuss and create projects to improve their student experience, and are a key component in dispersing the information they receive back to their respective communities. Every student in BCPS is eligible to apply. I encourage any and all interested board members to reach out to Ms. Stacy Wade if interested in connecting with students and hearing more about their experiences in BCPS through this group. We anticipate every secondary school, secondary school to have a representative this year. Lastly, BCSE and BCJC are taking a more conscious approach to serving every student in BCPS. Our main goal for this year is to provide equitable opportunities for every student who would like to be involved at the county level. We anticipate a great year ahead, full of student leadership, student voice, and strong advocacy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership. We don't have any unions speaking this evening, so category three is nonprofit community groups, and our first speaker is Marietta English from the NAACP of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so some things happened I, since I was here last time. So good evening, Chairperson Lichtner and Vice President Harvey and Superintendent Yarbrough, but I heard you called another <laughs> name today, so <laughs> I'm just going to call you Yarbrough because that's the name I know, and members of the board. I am Marietta English, and I chair AXO for the Baltimore County branch of the NAACP, and I'm also their education chair. I would like to begin by thanking you for your support of the AXO program. And for those who don't know what AXO stands for, it's the Academic Cultural Technological Scientific Olympics. We had a very successful trip to the national competition in Boston this summer. We won a bronze medal in modern dance, but I think he was robbed because he should have won a gold. A gold medal in sculpture and a gold medal in playwriting. Our playwriter, Corinne Branch, as you might remember, won gold for her poem last year and was offered a full scholarship to Coppin State University and was featured in the Baltimore Sun. This year, Corinne will be featured in the Afro-American newspaper and the president 
of Coppins Alumni Association would like to try to have her play performed at Coppin. And she is just a sophomore. Let's give these girls and boys a hand. You know, she has a bright future. And we know that our, we also had a student win a $10,000 scholarship for an essay she wrote about telling her story. So Baltimore County students are excellent. They are outstanding. And we should celebrate them all, time, all the time. We never hear about the good things that they are doing. And she also won a, a gold medal for her sculpture. We will begin our program in October, and I hope I can count on your continued support. We have great students, as I've said before, and we need to celebrate them every opportunity we get. My other hat is chair of the Education Committee. And Dr. Yarbrough, I will contact Ms. Sifter to schedule a meeting to discuss some of the concerns we expressed in our other meeting. Voter registration of our high school students, the Teen Summit in November, and African American Studies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Thompson from the Mothers for Liberty of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Superintendent Rogers, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. Tonight I'd like to speak on policy 6002, selection of instructional materials, which states instructional materials is defined as instructional content approved for system-wide use. This includes, but is not limited to textbooks, supplementary readers, materials of instruction, and visual and auditory aids. The BCPS Board of Ed is responsible for the selection and purchase of these instructional materials. School library media collections are selected and evaluated consistent with this policy. There are many, many parents and community members that want to ensure that all instructional materials available in the BCPS school setting are free of obscene words and imagery, pornography, vulgarity, and sexually explicit language and graphics. Minors are a protected class and should be free to learn in a safe environment without exposure to adult issues and themes. My recent Public Information Act request revealed that in the past year alone, 17 library books have been challenged in BCPS, with 12 listed as removed from the system. 10 of the 12 were Dr. Seuss books. Of those 17 books, it was decided that gender queer would be retained within BCPS libraries. My question for this board in regards to 6002 policy are, gender queer took 11 months to be reviewed. How many days does the review process take after receiving a request? This needs to be clear. During the 11 months of review for gender queer, additional copies were ordered by three schools. Is the curriculum book being pulled from the schools during this time frame? This needs to be clear. Why is the list of 6002 requests not online for the public to see which books have been re reviewed, which are being reviewed, and the decision of each request? This needs to be clear. If someone requests a book to be reviewed that has already been removed, will the book be reviewed again, or is the decision to remove the book final? This needs to be clear. Are these sexually explicit library books being used in the classroom by the teachers? This needs to be clear. Stated in the curriculum review policy, the curriculum review forms a process that is to assess the appropriateness of measurable outcomes and its link to achievement at all levels. These sexually explicit books do not achieve this, and if they do, I would like to see the data to support it. The school system's mission is to raise the academic bar and close achievement gaps. These books do not achieve this, and the data that we do have shows that the academic bar is being lowered and the achievement gaps are widening, and that is simply not acceptable. We have a lot to do to clean up our schools so that we are focusing on the main goals of education, which are reading, writing, and math, and those three things alone are the most important areas, and they're not being met, and the data shows this. Please consider this as, your review as you review future 602 forms Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Serhoff.
Good evening. Good evening. I wish to alert the school system to some things that we should not be starting the school year with. Students without a placement, students sitting at home because they don't have an appropriate placement to be in. I started the school year off this year with seven of those. I still have a couple left that are, that are not in appropriate schools, that are not even in a schoolhouse. This is not acceptable because these students who are special needs lose vital time when they don't have themselves in a schoolhouse. Some of, these, some of the reasons that we are seeing this still is because of the way we look at progress. I've had people from central office, people from compliance, telling me and my clients what we can and cannot say in a meeting, particularly if I raise the issue of grades, oh, we can't talk about that in an IEP meeting. Why not? You talk about it. Why, am I, why are my clients, the parents, being censored, but I can't censor you? Why can you talk about, look how well the student is doing. They're getting A's and B's, but I can't say to you, Excuse me, my child doesn't know multiplication and division and you're telling me they're getting an A in geometry on the high school level? Tell me, does we require rocket science to understand that there's a problem there? We have to stop making a, a boundary around grades and special ed. because they are one in the same thing. You can't tell me that if you're looking, that you're not looking at progress from year to year, you're only looking at it in isolation and say to me the child is making progress and the child's in the correct placement. I have students right now sitting at home, not getting instruction for three weeks and they don't see themselves getting into a class. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bash Faron. Good evening. Good evening. Congratulations, Dr. Rogers. I might make a mistake and call you with the previous name. But. All right, good evening to all. I have three points for you that I hope you will consider. Policy 8260 still talks that you are the body politic, body politic, line five, six. I objected to it and last time I had the opportunity. I really think it's the wrong word. You are the Board of Education. This is your task. Politic is a bad word to use, even though that Comer uses that phrase. Um, your focus should be really on the students um, to face the world. Today, both Chinese, Indian, and Vietnamese students are already in AI. Um, those our students are going to compete with them. Second point is about 9-11. We must not really forget 9-11. But I really don't know how the school system teaches about 9-11. I lived through the era of Islamophobia, Arabophobia after 9-11 for a long time. Recently, there has been a declassified report by the commissioners of 9-11, some of them, 
that the White House knew long time about it and did not do anything. So the reason I bring this to you is it is really important to teach 9-11 by facts. Students need to know the facts, all the facts. Last but not least, I really remembered you when I went up to the Empire State on the weekend. I was in a medical conference in New York. Building has been for almost 100 years, solid, strong history. And for you, the Board of Education, you are like building an Empire State, but each block of it is a student. We cannot graduate students that are not really up to par to face the world outside us, especially the Indians, the Chinese, Vietnamese. If you know about industry, electric vehicles are being exported from China and Vietnam in massive amounts to Western Europe, and they will be hitting the United States. They have the intellect, they have the organization, they have the fervor. So when we graduate students, just remember, they are not going to compete with Kentucky or Thank you. Our next speaker is Judy Deese. Good evening. Good evening. Well, hello everyone. My name is Judy Deese and I'm currently a resident of Baltimore County and I have nine grandchildren and six of which are in the Baltimore County public school system. And it's an honor to come out and speak to everyone. So I have a few questions for all of you today concerning the bathroom policies, the locker room policies, and the sports programs where you now have allowed trans students to enter the safe spaces of the opposite sex. My first question is, how could you be so enticed to listen to the opinions of a few to change policies that put all of our children in danger? My second question is, what has captivated all of you to go against what has always been such as separate facilities for our boys and girls to turn it upside down. I don't understand, and I would love an explanation. For you have a grand responsibility, every one of you here, and it's on your shoulders. You all have a due diligence to this community of parents, staff, and children. See, no one comes to me to remind me to do my due diligence in my profession, for it is my responsibility to serve lawfully and implement safety measures as I see fit for all persons involved. Just as I am selling a home to a client and I've noticed that the foundation is sinking in the home, it is now my responsibility and due diligence to warn my clients that there is a potential hazard in their future. It is my job to serve them and to keep them safe from potential danger and financial future hardship. So my question is why are you setting up a potential hazard for our children when it is your job to protect them. Anytime you create a pitfall, someone is going to fall into it. And we know that because of these policies, students are going to get hurt or damaged or traumatized, and it's inevitable. Your responsibility now is to keep our children safe, all of them. I'm asking today for the board to reconvene and to open up new conversation again amongst yourselves about these policies to truly analyze the potential for harm, the potential for danger, and to do your due diligence to protect our children. As I am not physically able to be present in the locker room with my 13-year-old granddaughter at the moment to shield her while she is changing her clothes, getting ready for her gym class. Us parents need your help. We really, really need you guys. And my prayer is that you consider my words today and my prayer is that my words would penetrate your heart in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Since there are speaker spaces available, we are going to call from the wait list. So Ms. Helene Groves is our next speaker.
Good evening. Hi, how are you? Good. It's always the nice comfy chair. <laughs> Um, my name is Helen Groves, and initially I had come out to speak on behalf of Campfield Early Learning Center this evening. Um, I have taught there for almost a decade, and I've taught in Baltimore County for 16 years. However, many of you have already heard what I and many, many of the community members in the Northwest have had to say. Uh, I know that you'll take it into account as we continue with the boundary study. Instead, I feel moved to speak Honestly, as a parent um, of two children enrolled in public school, as well as an SEL teacher and a special educator, uh, I wanted to take a moment to publicly thank the Board of Education, um, all of you, and Dr. Rogers, for your tireless devotion to championing, supporting, and promoting equitable access to instruction and instructional materials for all students and all families. It is so important for representation of all students and all stakeholders to be found in our curriculum and in our libraries. And I thank you for taking into account the guidance from MSDE as you evaluate policies that can often be very controversial. Again, this was not what I came out to say this evening. But I do want to thank you, because you do not get that often enough. And I appreciate, as a parent, that you do value all of our children and all of our educators. I feel safe in my work environment, and I know that my families do as well. I'm going to leave the rest <laughs> alone. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our public speaking, speaking comments. So thank you to everyone who came out um, to speak this evening. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. As the slides come up, we'll get started. Good evening again, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, members of the Board of Education. I'm pleased to share information this evening regarding budget season as we open schools. Today, all members of Team BCPS, next slide please. Today, all members of Team BCPS received a correspondence from me about budget season. I wanted to talk about the highlights of that uh, letter. Uh, the first thing is making sure that everyone understands that our budget season is a year-long process. In our year-long process, we engage offices, schools, leaders, and stakeholders to receive input and feedback about our next steps. With that being said, everyone knows that with the pandemic, we have all schools across the United States have received additional uh, funding. And with those additional uh, funds come challenges as September 30th, 2024 is the last date to uh, spend all of the ESSER funding. Millions of dollars have been um, provided to schools to provide uh, supports to students. Additionally, as in the state of Maryland, as we move forward with implementing the blueprint, making sure that the uh, pillars are implemented with fidelity, that comes with a price tag. And so we are going to work across offices and across divisions to identify potential savings to offset um, some of those needs and challenges that we see coming ahead of us in fiscal year 2025. And so this is an opportunity for all members of Team BCPS to really engage with us, for all members to understand how we put together a budget, um, how I put together with my team a budget to recommend to the board for approval before going to the county executive and the county council. Several opportunities will be available this year, including a survey for all states stakeholders across Team BCPS, community forums, area council meetings, public hearings, and we will be launching a new Budget 101 website. And so I am looking forward to working across uh, zones, across schools, across offices with all members of Team BCPS to uh, develop a strong budget for fiscal year 2025. Next slide, please.
And so if we rewind, just three weeks ago, we opened schools. Uh, 20,000 staff members came back and more than 111,000 students. Uh, it was truly a great first day. Some of you joined me uh, before 5.30 a.m. <laughs> Um, as we welcomed our students to great sounds and uh, the buses rolling, teachers coming in, everyone with a smile. And so we want you to uh, take a quick look at how we open schools in uh, Team BCPS. Please go to video. That awkward pause, everybody yeah. breathe. <gasps> They're working on it. Well, while we're waiting for it to start, <laughs> while we're waiting for the photo and the sound to start, I am very excited to share that the voices you hear will be of student interns. And uh, earlier today, we had our lead for CTE with us, uh, Dr. Grubbs, and part of the apprenticeship program has some interns in our communications office. Uh, they are working around the clock with us, and you will hear their voices debut and here we go. Good feeling. There we go. <laughs> welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Ah! Woo! Ah! <laughs> Tackle hug. Oh, that worked. Woo, thank you for waking me up. I appreciate that. Good morning. It's good to see you back, sweetie. First day, very exciting. Great to be here, Pikesville Middle. Uh, we got a lot of new families today. Our sixth grade families are nervous, but excited. Uh, and we're excited. Uh, we're ready to get this year started off on a great start. I have all the same emotions. I'm nervous, I'm excited, um, because it's a fresh start every year. And I have new friends to meet, um, new curriculum this year. So it's all, it's all new to me, too. Excitement was in the air as Team BCPS welcomed back more than 111,000 students into our 176 schools, centers, and programs. I am most excited about our students, welcoming all of our students back to school, making sure that they have a wonderful year. I'm very excited about our staff, the training and the support that they're gonna receive this year, and most excited about how we're all gonna work together to make sure that we improve academic achievement for our students. Everyone made sure that the students felt welcome and were ready for a great start to the school year. Your school is your community, but it also becomes your family for 180 days. And if you don't have that welcoming feeling when you walk at someone's door, you are going to struggle to come every single day. So it's that first initial, we welcome you back. I'm excited to see the maturity and growth that has taken place with our students over the summer. I'm excited to continue to engage with them. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to supervise uh, teaching and learning. And my hope is to just continue to see more academic progress with our students this year. I'm most excited about working on the morning announcements. Um, and I have a class called Advanced Tech Application. And I'll be making videos for the morning announcements there. And I'm excited about making, um, making some friends in that class. And I'm looking forward to a good school year. <laughs> Since freshman year, I've been, um, I've been in the ECP program, the early college program. I'm working to get my associate's degree, so by the time I graduate high school, I have my associate's and my diploma. Um, I oh, hope this you. year that I can take classes that will help me better in the future, to help me go towards that journalism um, degree. Have a wonderful Woodlawn Day. Goals and objectives were set. Students and their teachers were focused, and everyone was ready for new beginnings. Woo 
I want to thank the communications team for that video, and I can share um, and thank all the members of the board who joined me at uh, several school visits. Uh, truly, that those feelings, those sounds, uh, were in all of our schools at all levels across all zones. Want to thank the cabinet members who've worked tirelessly to make sure that we are ready for the first day of school. Uh, the lawmakers who joined us on those first week visits. Uh, special thanks to the 20,000 staff members uh, who were there to welcome our students in schools and in offices supporting schools, as well as the families of our 111,000 students uh, who reported to school on that Monday. We had a successful e uh, opening, and we appreciate the communication and look forward to a great year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Next on the agenda is the chair report, and that I call on me. So I have experienced the start of the school year as a BCPS employee in many roles, including special educator and school principal. This year, I had the unique opportunity and the tremendous privilege to start the school year as a BCPS board member. While there were similarities, the excitement of seeing students, staff, and families deciding what to wear, worrying about waking up at the right time, and making sure I had coffee ready to go at 5.30 a.m., there were some differences. As the chair of the board, the opening of the 23-24 school year meant looking at BCPS as a whole entity. I wasn't just focusing on my classroom or my school school or even the principals I was supporting. This year I looked at the opening of our system, our system as a whole, and I am so pleased to share that the 300,000 foot view is just as exciting if not more. The excitement and the passion for the start of this new school year has been palatable and evident in many ways. From the positive reactions and deep engagement of staff at a powerful ANS meeting that focused on celebrating our system leader and Dr. Rogers' message emphasizing teaching and learning, to stuff the bus to collect needed school supplies, to multiple media press conferences to tell the D team BCPS story, to board members meeting with our county executive to form a stronger collaborative relationship, to opening week visits, the excitement and the optimism for the future of our students, staff, and families is definitely there. The accessibility of our superintendent has created a spark in our staff, quickly igniting a positive climate and culture. When we visited schools, principals were excited to show off their buildings and their learning environments. Teachers were starting teaching and learning while, de while building relationships on day one. Students were smiling, well, most of the students were smiling, and excited to see their friends and meet their new teachers. Everywhere we visited, this energy existed. The short time spent in each school was never enough time. Everyone was eager to share the work that they had accomplished to start the school year right. I want to thank all of the school-based leaders who opened their doors for the superintendent, elected officials, and staff, especially all of those first-year principals who somehow got selected. I also want to thank Dr. Rogers for creating this renewed sense of purpose throughout our system. The future is bright for BCPS. The future also involves tough decisions for the sport and school system as we enter in a season of boundary study forums and capital project meetings. I want to thank members of the Team PCFS community for their advocacy on behalf of their school communities. I want to acknowledge and thank the Campfield community for their presence at the recent hearing and for the letters they have sent to board members. While board members are unable to provide immediate response at public hearings, we the board do hear your voice voice. We heard and we read your passion for Camfield Early Learning Center. It is obvious that your school provides a nurturing and supportive environment for our youngest learners. Your school community is built on trust, collaboration, and communication among families and staff. You embrace the welcoming community provided, the family atmosphere, and most important, a continuum of services that ensures that learners are successful while at Camfield, but also when they transition to their home schools. So thank you again for your passion and for communicating with us as a board as we deliberate on this very important decision.
I also want to thank the Office of School Climate and Culture for the Here For It campaign. This extremely vital campaign is working to create a culture of daily, on-time attendance for all of our students. With academic achievement being our top priority, students attending school each and every day is a priority of the utmost importance. We need our students in school for them to achieve at high levels. It's been great to follow our schools on social media as they embrace this campaign and use the resources resources provided to encourage and reinforce the importance of daily attendance. Through the use of school-based attendance teams, friendly competitions within schools and across schools, clever and motivating incentives, reviewing expectations with students, increased communication with families, and even through the use of attendance fairies at Rossville Boulevard, the Here For It campaign is taking off with great success. And lastly, thank you to our Area, advisory, area Education Advisory Councils. Last night, there was an introductory meeting with multiple councils to provide information concerning the councils and to encourage increased participation by the public. If you are interested in learning more about joining a council or attending their meetings, please search AEAC on the BCPS website. So thank you, BCPS, for an excellent start to what I truly believe will be a wonderful school year. And next on the agenda is our student board members report, and for that I call Ms. Drummond. Good evening, everyone. Although I'm not here for today's meeting, I'm so excited to be here. These past few weeks have given me such an amazing look into the position while still trying to slowly acclim acclimate myself to everything. I attended the administrative and supervisory meeting to say the Pledge of Allegiance and met some amazing current and past BCPS students. I finished out the rest of my two short summer and got ready for my senior year with both feet on the ground. With this position, I never realized how many people would know or look up to me as they have. So many students have already told me about when they saw me run or staff telling me that their children voted for me. I have, I've even had one student looking for advice when applying for themselves. The range that this position has is so much larger than I could have ever imagined. I have very proud parents, but my dad especially posts me on his Facebook every chance he gets. My dad's side family reunion that I attended about two weeks ago, everywhere I turned were relatives expressing how surprised they were by my speaking skills or my confidence in running for this position. They compared me to the shy little girl I once was who hid behind her parents. Those stories showed me how powerful how powerful we, the students of BCPS, are with the amount of resources and support we have to become the best versions of ourselves. While it can definitely be improved and more evenly distributed throughout the county, my experience has made me who I am, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for the 111,000 future leaders we are so lucky to have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. This is the second reader for this policy, and for that I call Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to readopt board policy 8260, duties and responsibilities, authority of individual board members. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policy 8260? So move, Stileski. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed FY 2025 state capital budget request. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm and Mr. Dixit. Mr. Platt. 
Good evening, Good Chair evening. Lichter, Vice Chair Hari, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management and Strategic Planning. I'm joined here with uh, Dr. Grimm, Chief Operating Officer, and Mr. Plate, who's the Director of Construction and Improvement. As you'll recall, on August 8th, uh, we introduced to the board our fiscal year 2025 special capital, uh, state capital budget request. Uh, a work session was conducted on August 22nd. Um, all the questions that were raised during the meeting and that we received in writing, we answered those questions. Uh, later on after that, um, a row was added to the capital request that uh, we presented to you, adding Southeast area, high school, middle school, uh, and or elementary school, and it was shared with the board on September 1st. Uh, we are here tonight to ask for your approval so that we can start preparing the big book for, to be presented to the state. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the FY 2025 state capital budget request as presented? Lichter. Yes, Ms. I have a motion to amend the current request. Okay, and your motion is? My motion is to amend line item one, the Northeast Area High, to update the area from TBD to Northeast, and to update the project to new. And thirdly, to ask the superintendent to work with the county executive to identify a Northeast site. Okay, do you want to? Of course. Yeah. Is there a second? For the for Ms. Hen's um, amended motion, second from Paul. Okay. So may I have a any discussion, Ms. Hen? Did you want to speak to your amended motion? Sure. Um, last year's state capital request, we um, the board decided to seek alternative locations um, for this project in the Northeast. Um, the County Council asked us to review one potential site at the Lafarge site that was deemed um, unacceptable or unusable. So I'm reopening the request to seek a more acceptable site. Also based on the need for seats in the Northeast area as well as the central area, um, the recommendation of the My I Pass recommendations is that seats are needed in both areas. So in order to fully address the needs for seats in the Northeast, I'm seeking um, support in identifying a site in the Northeast for this project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion about the amended motion? Ms. Booker Dwyer? Uh, why was it in this, in this item that we're looking at, why was it uh, first deemed as a replacement versus new? So in the past, we have talked about uh, replacing an existing school uh, to a new school to add the capacity to, uh, to, to the existing school. Uh, the issue is that the sites are difficult to find in that area, and the need is urgent. Uh, our projections indicate that by fiscal year, by school year 25, there'll be there will be seats needed that will exceed several hundred students. So we request the board uh, to, uh, to include our recommendation. Also, after the board meeting last time, we started a site study uh, for other schools to see if there are other schools in the Northeast area that might, might be more suitable. And when we come back to you uh, for the county budget, we'll talk about those site study too. Dr. Rogers? Yes, thank you. Uh, Ms. Hen, I just wanted to share with uh, everyone that part of our regular practice is ongoing meetings with the county executive and his team, capital meetings in both the Northeast and the um, Southeast are on our list as well as the Northwest CTE um, Center. And so that's, that's part of ongoing work. We just met as recently as last week. Um, and so I just wanted to put that, you know, on the record. These are meetings that we have on a regular basis, and this is part of our commitment to move forward with both the Northeast area and the Southeast area and the Northwest CTE. So. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thank you for that. Ms. Pumphrey? Just a comment that may clarify a little bit because I was part of this initial um, <clears throat> amendment back at a prior board meeting. Um, this initially through my IPS listed Lock Raven 
high school as a replacement school and that was changed to be to be determined just for clarification and I believe the site um, was assessed and deemed not inappropriate for building. Thank you for that Ms. Pumphrey. Other Ms. Harvey? So just a, a clarification on the information you just provided. We know that LaForge was was deemed inappropriate, uh, that there was an issue with Lock Raven. Is there, and you just said that there is ongoing assessment of other schools in the Northeast area. So is the current project deemed to be a new project or could it possibly still be a replacement project? I'm trying to so, understand the language. Good question, very good question. So as we had shared with the board last time, that when we take an existing school and add seats to it, we get a higher share of state participation. So since the seats needed are only few hundred seats, 300, 500, whatever those seats are, it will be in our interest to take an existing school on existing site, expand that, and that's what we had proposed for Lock Raven last time, and that's what we are considering for other schools if there's any other potential school. If we go on a new site, there may not be enough state funds to justify the project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Mr. Young. So on, on this document, it's listed as a replacement. So is this a replacement as in building a new school or is this a more of a renovation with an addition that we're looking towards? Because I know you said the immediate need is a few hundred seats by school year 25 versus, um, and how does that compare with trying to build a new school and the timeline with that? So the reason it is indicated as a replacement because at this time, what we know that we may be able to replace an existing school for the reason that I just shared. But when the more scope is determined as we study the, the process, it will perhaps be more likely re replacement with added seats. So if we take an existing school for 1200, with 1,200 seats and then expand it to 1,500 and replace that school, that's what perhaps we'll wind up doing. But more study is needed to get to that point. That's right. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I withdraw my motion to make an edit to the motion on the floor? Yes. If there's no motion on the floor. There is. There yeah, is, there is. And, and it was seconded. You are amending your amendment? By Ms. Frempong. I'm withdrawing my motion and making a, a revised motion based on the discussion. Okay, go ahead. I move to amend the fiscal year 2025 state capital budget request by amending line item one by updating the area to northeast and by updating the project to TBD and asking the superintendent to continue to work with county government to identify a suitable site in the northeast. Okay, so do we need a second for that amended motion? Is there a second? Second, Stolaski. If it's needed. If it's needed. So we do need a second for that, correct, Mr. Burns? Yes, uh, point of order. Uh, yes. Point of order, Madam Chair, just, just to make sure that you have your motion straight. Uh, <laughs> you okay. ha has anybody moved uh, to adopt the budget request as presented? Well, I made, I said that statement, but before we voted on it, Ms. Hen made her amended motion. Okay. So there hasn't been a primary motion yet. You so far have a request to amend the request. Correct. Okay. But well, so there was the original, there was the amendment, and now there's the. There was no original. Okay. That. My motion was primary as there was no okay. primary. Okay, so I never said, may I have a motion to approve? I thought we said that, but got stopped. You said it, but there was That we stopped it, okay. Okay. And you'd want a second on that. And that's you asked okay. me about the second, so I want to okay. go back to the original. I thought the amendments go you go first before the original. No? Okay. So you want me to go back to the original, Mr. Burns? Yeah, and that, you want, again, we need no, a second. So yes, there you go. 
So may I have a motion to, may I have a second to approve the FY 2025 state capital budget as presented, correct? Gina. There was not okay. a first. There wasn't a first. There wasn't a okay. first and there's a motion on the floor that we need to process first. The new motion. But the motion on the floor is an amendment. It was phrased as an amendment. That's why right. when you say you withdrew, At least when they have an issue, I know it's not me. <laughs> so Can we rewind the tape and yeah. I'll say? <laughs> One of the members just talked about withdrawing a motion. The point of order is there was never a motion to adopt, to a, a primary original motion to adopt. So there was, couldn't be an amendment because there's no primary motion. There could be a motion, but there couldn't be an amendment to a primary because there'd been no primary. So if you wanted to reset and then look at possible amendments, you would simply withdraw any pending motions and go back to making your primary motion, and then that could be amended. Okay, so it should have been an amendment to the primary motion? Which had not yet been made. Just a little too quick. No. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna call for the primary motion. May I have a motion to approve the FY 2025 state capital budget request as presented? So moved, Pumphrey. Is there a second? Second, Harvey. Thank you. Any discussion? Now, I now Ms. Chair. Hen will go to your, ed Thank go you. ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to amend the fiscal year 2025 state capital budget request by amending line item one by updating the area to Northeast and by updating the project to TBD and asking the superintendent to work with county government to identify a suitable site in the Northeast. Is there a second to Ms. Hen's amended motion? Second, Dominowski. Thank you, any discussion? Ms. Hen, do you wanna, or you already spoke to it? I've, I've spoken to okay. it, if there are any questions I can. Ms. Pumphrey? I just have a quick question. The initial, my IPS, um, had the school set at Lock Raven to be in the central area, but it was still to alleviate overcrowding in the northeast area, is that correct? Was it also to alleviate overcrowding in the central area? And if by moving it to the northeast, will that take away that option? No. Madam Chair, may I speak to that? Um, or is that a staff answer? Staff. Right. Probably wants staff. Uh, Pete, if you could speak to what the Lock Raven site did in the central location. So Lock Raven site is on the northeast part of the county, but northeast, but Lock Raven also, and Mr. Plate, I need your help on that, is part of the central planning region. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. So it is part of the central planning region, but it is located in the northeast part of the county. So when in the my pass, our understanding is that the school is needed or capacity is needed in the northeast part of the county. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski? I just wanna make sure, I'm, so when we put replacement, that means eventually or potentially we're gonna have to close another school so we can replace it with a bigger facility to, to with more seats, is that correct? So more study is needed, but from what we know at this time, it appears that the current school can function. The site is large enough that another school can be constructed while the, uh, this current school is functioning. Right, but I'm just trying to understand the difference between a replacement and new. Um, if you're calling it a replacement, that means it's going to replace another school, so it's going to close another school. So replacement is a state terminology as part of the state terminology. If you are building a new school where no school existed, state defines it as new school. If you are building a school where school exists, but you are replacing it or making it larger, the state defines it as replacement. Okay, so my other question would be, if, if we need more seats and the studies show that, you know, smaller class sizes are actually better, why wouldn't we, entertain the idea of a new school as opposed to a replacement school? So the replacement school will be a new school in the proposed budget. It will not be existing school. The existing school will be demolished upon completing a building a new school. Correct, but it would, it would be adding the additional seats to the same school. I mean, it's a new school, but it really it's the same school, just bigger. Yeah, 
So it's going to make, and then so instead of just, uh, all I'm saying is, why can't, as to Ms. Hen's point, look at both sides instead of trying to make a really big school with a lot of kids in one area when we know we, we're going to need the space look at it as okay we'll keep this school and have a, and look for a site for another school where we can fill the seat and maybe have more room because all we keep seem to be doing is expanding so there are two issues in there that okay. i know right now one is that the new school will have limited state support. So when, we, when state counts the seat, so if we convert a 1,200 seat school to 1,500, we get funded state share for all 1,500. But if we build a new school and we can only justify 300 additional seats, then state will not fund because the seats are already there in an existing school. So that's one reason. The other reason, uh, reason is that it's difficult to find that larger site in that part of the county. Yes, it would be difficult to find for a 1,500 students, but say 700 or 800 students. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm not saying a 300 high school is, you know, that's my children's elementary school is bigger than that. Um, it's just I don't understand why we wouldn't fight with the state to say, hey, this is a better idea to do 800 in this and 1,000 in this or 800 and 900 as opposed to f going from 1,200 to 1,500 students in one building. So the process yeah. with the state is that they are very clear about they will provide funding for the additional seats. They will provide funding for if you expand their school for the previous seats plus expanded seat. That's not our process, the state's process. Okay. And, and it could be tens of millions of dollars of uh, potential state funding. So yes, there is another way to do it, just ignore the state funding and build it, but then county will have to carry the additional load. And the need, as, as the board knows, we have a need of $4 billion in capital improvement area. So, so we are careful about proposing options that are not cost effective. Madam Chair. Okay. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, to Ms. Pumphrey's question, because this was my amendment, I'd like to speak okay. to it if I may. Go ahead. Um, my IPAS never recommended a mega Lock Raven as the solution for central seats and northeast area seats. It was proposed to address our need for central area seats. Um, the study also recommended a solution, whether that be an addition or expansion or a new school in the northeast area, to address the need for those seats. So they were always two separate projects, according to my IPAS. However, we, we were on our county partners for funding so my, my proposal is to address the need for the seats where they are we need to address central we need to ad address northeast they're not mutually exclusive um, to the Towson project the Delaney projects those will assist with the seats that are needed in the central area Lock Raven still a possibility on the table what my motion attempts to do is address the northeast seats without disrupting so many families between Lock Raven and um, eastern area of Baltimore County by addressing that particular need along the northeast and eastern corridor. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Did you want to see something, Superintendent? I think Ms. Dominowski, are you okay with the fiscal implications? Okay, I, yeah, I think she. Ms. Harvey? Uh, I think Ms. Dominowski is. Okay. So I just, I just uh, have a quick clarification. The initial plan to that identified Lock Raven was based on the fact that although it is in the central zone for the school system's purposes, it is physically north. It is physically located in the northeast part, part of, the, of the county. Yeah. So when we use terms like central versus northeast versus northwest, that is the system's classification, not necessarily a geographical location. So in terms of a northeast area high school, Lock Raven is in the northeast part of the county. Is that my understanding? Am I understanding Everything that correctly? Everything you said is consistent with what we understand it to be. Okay. I just needed that clarification. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Stoleski, do you still have a question? Um, thank you. Um, I know that land is scarce, but 
um, in thinking about the proposal for a um, relatively speaking smaller high school, do we have um, like um, sort of a map display to show what land would be available and if that suggestion for a uh, relatively speaking smaller high school, would that even be possible? So um, I'd like to remind board that before we came to the Lock Raven option, an independent study by a consultant was done to just answer those issues that you're talking about. And they looked at all potential sites. We worked with our county partners. We looked at every potential site that might be available. And that's their recommendation, that that site and now we are following up with another study to look at other schools in the Northeast and see if there's any other site that is within the Northeast site. But the conversation here is that why Lock Raven? Because it's in the Northeast part of the county and because it will provide the maximum state support if we expand or make a school larger than what it was. And those are the two primary factors. Okay, Mr. Young. Ms. Fremprong. Okay, Ms. Fremprong. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand and clarify because this whole Northeast slash Central, um, when that study was done, and I remember you um, came to the advisory in the Northeast in December and spoke about like the different options. At that time, was there an option to expand any actual Northeast schools? And so I understand what you say about geographically, that Lock Raven is in the Northeast. But when we think about the Northeast corridor, we're talking about um, like Perry Hall, Parkville. And so also you'd have to consider those students would be traveling pretty far from where they are now if we talk about putting in a, a high school in Lock Raven. So yes, it was done. And not only that, we are following up with another study to take a second look to see if there is any other school. Perry Hall is a large high school mm -hmm. as it is. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are studying. And if you could find another school, we'll come back to you and we'll share that with you. Okay, Great. Okay, Mr. Young. So on this um, budget request, it Items four and five, Towson and Delaney, it has area um, central, or C for central. The item one, the school, Northeast Area High School. Um, Ms. Hen's request is to have the area go from TBD to Northeast. So looking at not geography, that Lock Raven or whatever school is in the northeast portion of the county, but in that area that we've defined as one of the five geographical Areas. With that being said, if we if we do make that northeast, what's the impact on your ability to complete the studies to determine where the best place to put the school is? So we are in the process of doing that. Like I said, we are taking an, another look at it, uh, but time is also against us. So the longer we take to identify a site, the longer it will take to provide those seats. So uh, yes, we are looking at other schools also. But so, okay, I guess my question is, if we say you're, you're limited now to only what is defined as the Northeast area, the, what is the impact on what your ability to look at this process as a whole? You know, are we now tying your hands to prevent you from looking for the best solution? Somewhat. Mr. Dixon, if I might. Thank you. Mr. Young, it absolutely reduces flexibility. However, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, I think where we need the greater flexibility is uh, reflected in Ms. Uh, Hen's proposed revision to the amendment where the project is TBD, where it can be a replacement or it can be a new project. That's where we need maximum flexibility so we can explore the existing options as well as if there are any new options that you know didn't come to light with the first study. Um, you know, as you uh, pointed out, number four and five are clear in terms of um, you know which geographic region of the county, but the type of project is where we need the maximum flexibility. 
Miss Booker Dwyer? So I, I feel like for this project, we need maximum on top of maximum flexibility because this gets at the larger issue of the boundaries in Baltimore County, where we keep looking at the historical boundaries instead of with the future forward focus. We know that there's limited land, and so we need to, you know, we really do need to take a holistic look at the boundaries. And so I would want to see the area TBD. I want to see the project TBD because we need to seriously do a holistic boundary study for Baltimore County and look at all of our schools and, and to see the best options for them. So I wouldn't want to limit you in the area or the project. If the school has to enter into you know part of the central um, area, then so be it. But let's look holistically at these boundary studies so okay so we'll get let's right. get ready so let's do a roll call vote oh, no, no. Uh, wait no I, I, get ready? I, I have oh. an amendment oh you're gonna amendment okay so, um right so well if you look at what miss hen wrote i think you have part of it no. we have part of it right. so i want to amend that to include for the area i want to keep it as tbd so area tbd project tbd so i move that we amend the proposed amendment to TBD area to in, project to TBD and the um, area to TBD. Does so that make sense? One's already TBD, so I think you right. just oh, oh, you're amending the amendment, not the initial. Okay. Okay. So second. Okay, Miss Hen, second. Do you want to speak to it, or you Ms. just Harvey. did, Miss Harvey? Harvey. Second. You just spoke to it. I just it. spoke to okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Now discussion, Miss Hen. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate your comments, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Um, the My iPass study did take a holistic look at all of our high schools across the county and recommended separate solutions. Um, they recommended by area. Um, that's how they chose to structure the study. But they looked at, they didn't look exclusively at any one given area. They did look holistically countywide. Um, if Mr. Dixit is, is saying that Lock Raven is in the Northeast area, my original motion does not take Lock Raven off the table. It, you know, if we end up moving forward with that, that's the best site, then it goes um, as originally planned. So by limiting it to Northeast, doesn't remove Lock Raven off the table either. May limit, you know, schools in the Northwest or, you know, elsewhere. Um, we just completed a very difficult boundary study that included a wide area of the county. I would hate to disrupt as many families unnecessarily if we d can come up with two capital projects that make sense and provide the needed central area seats as well as the Northeast area seats. Yes, there's going to be some overlap and we're not going to say, oh no, you're in the central, you're in the Northeast, so you can't be affected. At the same time, I I don't think a one size fits all to address the central and northeast is the right solution here. So I will be supporting my original motion only because it leaves Lock Raven on the table. Other um, questions or comments to Ms. Booker Dwyer's? Go ahead. Yes. So just as a response to that, I appreciate that clarity. Um, so in the modified amendment, Lock Raven is on the table as well as everything else. And so when we are thinking about innovation, when we are thinking about reimagining uh, learning spaces for our, to best meet the needs of our students, we don't want to limit the staff for Baltimore County Public Schools to put the best thinking and the best resources available. So um, so that's why I, 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 I would like the amendment to be the TBD, both TBDs. Um, that way we can maximize the, the thinking and bring the best thinking to bear here. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote on Ms. Booker Dwyer's amendment? Ms. Dominowski? No. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Dolesky? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Fever is five. So Ms. Booker Dwyer's motion did not pass. Now we are voting on, can we have a roll call vote on Ms. Hen's amended motion? I'm sorry, can you read that so that we right. I move to amend the FY 2025 state capital budget request by amending line item one 
by updating the area to northeast and by updating the project to TBD and asking the superintendent to work with county government to identify a suitable site in the northeast. Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? No. Ms. Frempo? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? No. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Lichter? No. Favor is six. So that also does, it passes because of Ms. Drummond. Okay, so that motion passes. So we still have one more vote, which is on the, the original motion for the entire document, correct? As amended. Okay, so may we have a roll call vote on the original, Mr. McMillian? Can I ask Mr. Pete one question? Yes. In regards to the addition of the uh, Southeast Area Elementary School, Middle School, High School, it says priority two. What do you mean by priority two? That is exactly what it is. It is the second priority subject to meeting all other requirements. If the funding is available from the state and county, if the design work is completed, that will be the second priority. All of these priorities are based on funding by state and county. And as you can see, for Northeast and Southeast area, high school, middle school, and elementary school, there is no funding at this point. So, so all of them are priority twos? No, all, one and two are, but in, other, in priority three, there are funds associated with that. So the, the intent, Mr. McMillian, is that both the Northeast and the Southeast projects will move forward together at the same time? Yeah. Okay, may we have a motion to approve the amended FY 2025 state capital budget request as amended? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Yeah. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. So motion passes. Thank you, and thank you for answering all of our questions. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of Camfield Early Learning Center program closure. For that, I call on Mr. On Dr. Grimm and Mr. Dixit and Mr. Taylor. So good evening again. I'm not going to introduce <laughs> since you are Mr. Taylor is uh, the new person here and you all know him, he's director of strategic planning. So on Camp Field on August 8, 2023, a recommendation to close the Camp Field Early Learning Center was presented to board. The proposed closure is a part of comprehensive plan in the Northwest region to, to reduce overcrowding in elementary schools in that area and provide better facilities for a student and to hopefully improve the program uh, at, for the camp field student. This plan is supported by four capital projects that will add capacity to that region. We anticipate that the projects will be completed in four years. A public hearing for the closure was held on August 23, and some of you had attended that meeting. Uh, there were six speakers who spoke very passionate about the support of the program. Uh, and Dr. Grimm and I and Mr. Taylor, we were all there. The closure plan includes the return of kindergarten program to the home schools and return of the four-year-old pre-K and three-year-old preschool program to, to the student of home schools or the regional centers. So at this time, we are asking for your approval to close the Camp Field Early Learning Center. May I have a motion to approve the Camp Field Early Learning Center program closure? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Is there a second? 
Second from Pong. Thank you. Okay, any discussion? Ms. Dominowski. So my, I went to the, the meeting and I listened to the, peop, the, the teachers and the parents talk and my concern is that this center is for you know, some of our most special needs children and their needs are being met in this school. <coughs> so it's hard for me to justify closing such a school. Doc, Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Uh, one of the uh, things that we need to elevate for you know, our public and all members of the board is with the plan for the expansion of capital projects, um, we will have, I think it's 650 or more full day pre-K three and pre-K four seats. And when we're speaking about our special education programs, they're all going to be serving students in their home schools. So we currently have um, outside general education and inside general education uh, programs for three-year-olds and four-year-olds in Camp Field. Those programs are not going away. They will be going to the home schools uh, with those expanded uh, capital projects for the students. The only uh, area that we have at Camp Field that right now we haven't designated a space, but the team has already started works, uh, working on is the Judy Center. We have a Judy Center at the Camp Field um, Early Learning Center, which provides a lot of resources to our families, and we want to make sure that that's still accessible um, years down the line when our if the board uh, you know, approves the closure, that we're still providing those resources to all of the families in that geographic region. So, Manaski. So my only thing with that is, we keep talking about needing more seats and building bigger schools, and this is a smaller school for a reason. These kids need that more um, individualized attention. I know they can, they'll get it in a smaller classroom, but it's still gonna be in a much bigger school, and I'm worried about that for them. Um, so I, I just, I'm, I'm really hard, um, it's a really hard decision for me to make on this one, that's all. Thank you. Ms. Stoleski? Yes, good evening, and thank you for all of the work that went into um, determining possible closure. Um, I was also at the hearing and um, in listening to community members, the one thing that I can't wrap my head around is that the new programs for all of the children that go to this amazing community school, it just would not replicate itself and my heart is just speaking of how important it is to put children first and it just seems that I, I, I can't wrap my head around a rational reason why the replacements would give all of those students an equal experience to what they currently have. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Uh, yes. So I attended the hearing and I think we all agree that the staff at Canfield are amazing, that they work really hard to build relationships with families and to care about students, to hear stories like a teacher carried a student from the bus to the class every day for a week because he wanted to relieve that child's anxiety is the bar that we want to set for every student at every BCPS school. And so I hear what my colleagues are saying about if this is a gem in our system, why are we making a possible decision to close it? And I've heard, that, I've heard the recommendation, but I'd like the team to speak to why we're making that recommendation. I also uh, want to stress that I, I explicitly trust the leadership of Dr. Rogers. And should we come to a decision that we have to uh, close Camp Field and open these programs in the home schools, that those wonderful teachers will be following those students in some of those schools, hopefully, and that uh, we can replicate the services uh, within those classrooms because these are some of our most vulnerable students and we have an obligation to care for them. So can the team speak to why we're making this recommendation? 
Thank you, Ms. Harvey. And I think with the passion that you spoke to about what every child deserves in Baltimore County is exactly what we need to be doing with this. Um, I too have heard uh, staff members and family members speak about their experience, but it shouldn't be an experience that only happens at Camp Field Early Learning Center. Um, they, the staff and the students and the families have created a very positive, welcoming atmosphere that at any school that you go to in Baltimore County, you should experience. Additionally, uh, with some of that, uh, because of the welcoming atmosphere, we're able to overlook some of the challenges that exist, like transportation, having some of our youngest learners taking very long uh, bus rides to get to and from Cramp Field Early Learning Center, and the transportation transition that occurs after you have finished the pathway of Camp Field Early Learning Center and you have to transition to another school. And so I, I think our challenge, our responsibility is to communicate, but also to minimize transitions and to create the atmosphere that every student should experience in their school. Like you said, the teachers, um, you know, will go to other schools. Uh, the other schools, the capital projects have been uh, developed, funding has been provided based on al accounting for those numbers of students to return um, to their school. And part of the students returning is that you need the staffing with the teachers, which would be in uh, very close proximity. And so uh, I think it's a complicated response to about why this decision was made. When uh, capital projects were being designed, you know, uh, before my time, the uh, school of thought about about bringing students back to their home school for that whole community from age three to fifth grade was part of the thinking. But what we have heard loud and clear is there is a sense of community and an atmosphere that we must provide in all of our elementary schools so that every parent has the same level of connection in terms of the services that their students are, re are receiving in schools. Um, and so I appreciate uh, you highlighting you know, the messages that you've heard from families and giving us the opportunity to speak to um, whether or not it would uh, be different. These are our youngest learners and there's a phasing process and so as a three-year-old you would start in the school that you would stay in until you were in the fifth grade um, and our policy you know has some stipulations to allow students and families to make that choice to stay and uh, phase out that we're not uh, causing interruptions in the middle. So those are some of the um, considerations that we're making as we try to take a holistic view on improving these capital projects across uh, Team BCPS and create the best uh, circumstance for all students. Thank, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I understand I've visited Camfield. I've worked with a lot of the um, people at Camfield, and I understand the, the want to keep that school opened. But as a former principal of a comprehensive elementary school that had a three-year-old program and had a four-year-old program, you can replicate the feeling, the atmosphere, the programs that are taking place at Camfield in a comprehensive school. Um, to Ms. Harvey's point and to Dr. Um, Yarbrough's point, um, and this, the timing of this is good that we have time. We have time to make sure that when we send, when we close Camfield, that the schools that will receive new three-year-old programs and four year old programs are ready to receive those students and are ready to give them that successful experience that they are having right now at Camfield. The other thing is, as a principal, I wanted my babies with me. I wanted my threes and fours and kindergarten students in my building. I wanted to get to know them right away. I didn't want to get to know them as a kindergartner or a first grader. I wanted that early childhood piece. So while there is a lot of wonderful things about the current Camfield, it is incumbent on us to be able to replicate those experiences and that success, and it can be done. We have examples of it taking place right now throughout our county. We just had, we need the time to make sure that our teachers, our administrators, and our communities are ready to embrace those kids when they get back. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Young? Mr. Dixick. I think we're, you've heard all of us have sort of torn about this, but um, my question to you is when we look at Campfield, when we look at the age of the building, can you speak to, you know, 
first the age and then um, what will be required to maintain that building as is. Um, because I know in earlier in Dr. Rogers' report, she talked about, you know, the fiscal cliff that we're approaching and that, you know, yes, there are limited funds. But so can you speak to us about the impact of trying to keep the building open with its age? So <clears throat> it's, it's a difficult question, but I'm going to give you as good an answer as I know. Camp Field is an old building. Camp Field needs improvement, but it is safe right now. It is being, we have put maintenance dollars to make it safe. The quality of buildings that we are replacing it with, like Dr. Rogers indicated, is, it, the camp field doesn't, is nowhere close to that quality. The physical environment that will be provided to our kids in the new building is far superior. And it's not only to those kids, but all kids in their neighborhood. So if you're looking about the quality of space, uh, the newer space, will, will, they are far better. Mr. Manowski? I just have one question. Um, is this site going to be um, in consider if this is closed, are you, is it going to be in consideration for the new Northwest CTE Center? That determination has not been made yet, but that is one of the potential uh, use. Uh, offices are always needed. That's another potential use, but superintendent hasn't made that decision, and our funding partners have not funded any of the things. So that is still under consideration. Before we do anything, we'll come to you and we'll share that. So it's, it's, not, it's not under consideration right now, but it's a, it's a possibility that it could be. All, all options are under all consideration options. right all now. Are... Yeah, for that site. Okay. So the site, the site will be re, the term we use is repurposed, and that that repurposing will be identified based on the goals that are consistent with the other capital projects that we have in the area. So all of the the four capital projects that we have underway to expand all the seats in the area play into this plan to alleviate Camp Field. And if this is, if the closure of this physical school building is approved, that in concert with these other decisions will determine what options that we have for the current Camp, camp Field site. So the CTE Center is one option among others that the board can choose to make. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Ms. Poker Dwyer. And so if the vote is not to close Camp Field, then that impacts the funding, the capital funding for the other schools in the area, like Deer Park Elementary, that expansion. So all the seats that have been accounted for with the potential of the Camp Field students going to those schools, it would impact those capital projects, correct? That's correct, at least one project. At least one, so to the point where that project may not proceed or may not even happen so it, the closure of Campfield is dependent on that the the renovation of a school is dependent on the closure of Campfield that's true okay and has there ever been any analysis done of how the student performance and so those students coming from Campfield and how they perform when they're when they enter into the comprehensive high school versus the students who were um, in a comprehensive high school uh, not high school elementary school um, for you know great for uh, for being three-year-olds up has in that type of analysis ever been done to see if Campfield is producing um, students that are more successful more successful yeah that's not information that I'm aware of. We can certainly follow up. Okay. Ms. Frampong? So I may be a little bit early in saying this, but I'm just going to say the comment. Um, so I think a lot of the concerns is that, again, we have a great school, it sounds like, great students and the supports that they need. And so the concern is we're taking them into the unknown. And so if we do make the decision to close Camp Field, um, I guess I'm doing an early, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but 
an agenda item as far as agenda agenda setting, I think it would be good to continue to hear throughout these meetings what are the steps that are being taken to, if you want to say ensure or try to replicate that we have that same type of support um, programs, et cetera, for, um, for these students. I know we have Padonia and Honeygo, like you mentioned, um, Chair Lichter, about having schools that have that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think if the, the parents, the public, the staff are able to hear what is it that we're really doing um, to try to make sure that we take care of our babies and give them the supports that they need and opportunities to be successful, I think that will help as well. Thank you for that. May I have a roll call vote on the motion to approve the Camfield Early Learning Center program closure? Ms. Jaminelski? No. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? No. Ms. Stolesky? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Mm. No. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is six. So the motion does pass, correct? Yes. Okay, so the motion does pass. Thank you, everybody. I know it was a very difficult decision and vote. Thank you, staff. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Mr. Burns. Madam Chair, Superintendent Rogers, members of the board, uh, in your closed session earlier this evening, the board uh, considered two uh, administrative appeals, uh, HE 23-25, HE 23-39. Um, you took an action on them, and this would be appropriate time to uh, move to confirm the action you took in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's cases HE 23-25 and HE 23-39 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Hen. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Pong. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session with respect to MDL 2913, JCCP 4546, and JCCP 5052? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Recuse. Ms. Frempa? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next, thank you, Mr. Burns. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Buildings and Contracts Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the Board's Building and Contract Committee met on Monday, September 11. I am asking for items N1 through N8 to be forwarded to the full board for approval, separating items N9 for discussion as requested by Ms. Dominowski. Um, do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N8? So moved, moved. from Paul. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion on N1 through N8? 
May I have a roll call vote, please? Who made the move? Wait, there's a couple. Ms. Frempa. Um, Ms. Damanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempa? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Do I. Do I have a motion to approve item N9? So moved, Pumphrey. No second is needed. Any discussion? Ms. Domanowski. Yes. Um, we also went over this uh, at great length um, in the curriculum committee, and there was a lot of concerns and some questions that uh, we'd asked to get answers for. I don't know if Ms. Shea wants to come forward. Actually, can we have Dr. D. Donato, uh, Dr. Kraft? And Ms. Shea can come forward. Sorry. You were hiding back there, Ms. Shea. Okay. She couldn't see you. <laughs> We're joined by Dr. D. Donato, Chief Academic Officer, Ms. Shea, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning, and Dr. Kraft, Director of English Language Arts. Ms. Jebanowski, do you have a particular question or just? Yes, I do. Um, first off, did you, were you able to find um, how many teachers we have certified or, or retraining for um, the Wilson reading system? I, yes, we do. Um, So the, the Wilson Reading Certification, the full certification requires 135 hours of additional training. We have offered that to teachers to complete. At this time, we have one uh, staff member who is in process to complete that. Um, however, we have 32 teachers who have completed that at this time. Okay. And for the Orton-Gillingham, how many teachers do we have certified for secondary instruction? We have 32 secondary uh, special educators trained in Orton-Gillingham, and 15 teachers are in process. And um, going over the contract, this uh, the 180, it was started in 2020 as a one-year, four-year extension, so five years altogether. And do we have any, I mean, so it's been in play for four, three years now. Do we have any um, data that shows it's improving our students um, at the tier two level of reading and you know, um, so, so as we, yep. so as <laughs> we shared at contract committee, um, some of those highlights of data points, when students are receiving the program consistency with fidelity over time, we have seen up to um, 1.7 and 1.9 years growth in a single school year. However, that relies on consistent implementation of the program, and that is a absolute focus for the current school year with additional training and support for both school administrators as well as teachers at the school level so that we can ensure that that's happening. So how do we ensure that's happening? Because we, we spent to almost 2.5 million and asking for another million, and we don't know unless, and we don't have, it's not a certification, so it's not like the teachers can be certified, and we know they're teaching it with fidelity. How do we ensure that this is going to be taught with fidelity? Ms. So Dominowski, if I can, thank you uh, for that question. As you know, academic achievement is one of our priorities. Um, the board also passed a contract approximately three years ago with a professional learning system that allows us to roster the professional learning that teachers have to receive. Um, the importance of that is there is accountability, that if you're on the roster, 
only after you engage in the professional learning are we able to see a record of that, as well as vice versa. If you're not, if you don't take the um, training that's necessary, or if you're a new hire and you come in, we see that you haven't taken the training. We are able to work with uh, not only our chief academic officer, but also our chief of schools mm -hmm. to communicate that information directly to principals with clear expectations about training. Um, so, you know, that is part of our work that we're doing uh, this year. We have those system-wide professional development days. We're looking at the data that we have for rosters, whether we're talking about ESOL, literacy, or mathematics, to identify where those gaps are, and then making um, those training opportunities mandatory that we're working with principals directly and executive directors. Uh, because part of the uh, questions that you're asking, and rightfully so, uh, Read 180 is based on site licenses for individual students. We have the data showing that we have students in need at the secondary level of this comprehension uh, support in schools. But we have to implement it with fidelity to see the growth that uh, Read 180 as a former principal, both middle school and high school, I used it. It was scheduled in my buildings. Um, there are Lexile regular uh, you know, assessments that you give the students so that you can see their progress and their growth. I think what we need to do is to make sure that we have all of those systems in place. We're able to see from the system view what the Lexiles are looking like of our students, whether or not it's sh showing growth, so we can make an informed decision when it comes time to the spring of whether or not this is a program that we need to continue or whether we need to take a look at a different product. But our first step needs to be ensuring implementation with fidelity at the secondary level across our schools based on our student data. So my only concern with that is we, our data is showing that our students are not are, are below where they should be on an, an average in the secondary level. And we've had this for three years. And you're saying that if it's taught with fidelity, there is the growth. But that's a smaller, um, cat that's a smaller group of students as opposed to on the whole. So I'm just, I'm just concerned about throwing more money into this when we don't know that it's actually working for, so, those, for all the students, not just the ones that are getting it with fidelity, but for all those students. And are we categorizing the tier or are we evaluating tier two? Are they maybe needing tier three and not this tier two? So I would ask Dr. Kraft to speak to tier two versus tier three, how we make those specific determinations. But I can share with you in terms of read 180 and the data for the, um, I. You have to double check the uh, numbers, but large percentage of the students, you're going to see at least one and a half years of growth. And when I talk about implementation with fidelity, I'm saying that it can't be a pullout group. It can't be when it's convenient. It needs to be in your schedule, a teacher that is trained, that you're teaching the lessons, that you're doing the centers, that you're doing the regular um, assessments to make sure that your students are meeting, uh, you know, making progress as you go throughout the year. That's what we can't sit at the board table right now and say that across the board in all of our schools we can guarantee you that read 180 was taught with fidelity in all of our secondary schools what we can say is that we have the data based on test scores and other pieces of data that dr. Kraft and Ms. Shea can speak to specifically that identify students who have needs in comprehension which are you know those tier two and then you go to the tier three uh, where you were speaking about Orton Gillingham um, as well as I believe we we have at least one other tier three program that we're providing uh, many times for our students uh, who have individualized uh, education programs, IEPs, where there is a monitoring uh, system and a requirement that is more stringent than the tier two, that this is part of our work as we move forward with increasing academic achievement, that we have to make sure that we're providing the resources to our teachers, we're giving them the time, and we're providing the feedback and the support, as well as ensuring that our administrators are well versed so they know what they're looking for and that they're going into the classroom giving feedback but I would invite um, uh, Dr. D. Donato, Dr. Kraft, Ms. Shea, uh, to share specifics around tier two versus tier three. Uh, so thank you these are all great questions so I'm gonna try to go through them but if I miss one just uh, come come back to it so uh, so how do we know it's working and so I would say that we have some 
evidence of efficacy in looking at not only uh, the amount of growth in terms of Lexile, um, which also correlates to grade level, so how many grade levels did they grow, uh, but we also look at other things like MAPR. We look at things like their uh, CBAs. We, so we look at a, a multitude of things, including GPAs. Do we start to see what's happening in reading transfer to other, uh, other places? And so we look at uh, several things. We don't want to just look at any one thing, but we want to look holistically. What I can say about Read 180, um, having actually taught Read 180 myself, is that it does breed success. And I have seen students at the high school level use Read 180 and go on to college and place into college level English and not need remedial courses. Um, it is also listed on the ESSA evidence um, database as one of the only um, secondary reading interventions that is approved. And so. If there are pockets where it's not working, I would suggest that we have some work to do around is there implementation fidelity, um, is the, um, have all the scheduling considerations been made, and so those are the things that we've been leaning in on, and so each year I would say we're doing a little bit better, and, and you're right, we have been doing it for a couple of years. The first year was a very small pilot. Um, and then the second year was actually the tutoring grant. And so most of our money was spent for, towards that tutoring grant for reading, um, which is a, was a very different model. That was that after school model, not the you know class period. And so, um, so I would just offer that there's a couple of different things, which is like the first year we had three schools that were doing it. And so you're not going to see, so when you say our secondary scores still don't look good, right? It was a very small pilot um, tutoring grant. And then now I would say we're actually in a really good uh, routine. And so some of the things that we've done to ensure that we are helping students move is what is the placement? How do we place them? How do we exit them? What data sources are we using? And the other thing that's really exciting, and we have partnered really closely closely with um, um, the schools to, to do data meetings three times a year. And so the administrator and the reading contact are there. We review beginning of the year data, mid-year data, and end of the year data, which allows us to not wait for a whole year to pass and say, I don't think something's working. Um, so we really can course correct mid-year if we see something's not happening. And, and so while we shared the overall data for the end of the year, we also look at mid-year, we look at how many minutes are students um, on the software. What, um, what are they doing? How are they progressing? Have they completed a zone? All of those things are indicators to success. So then for your other question about tier two versus tier three, so read 180 actually qualifies as a tier two or tier three. What is going to change between a tier two and tier three is intensity. So that could be the amount of time that they get it. So instead of being um, a period every other day, they would get it every day. You could also reduce class size. So instead of having a class of 18 to 21, you might say we're going to have eight to 10 students and really have it intensely. And so it can be used for both. We also know it's not, it doesn't meet every one's need and so progress monitoring is a really important part of that uh, and that we don't continue to do something that is not moving st student data um, and not just holistically but for each individual student is this working for this student in particular and so um, those are a couple of things um, that we are doing to ensure that students have what they need um, and if they need a tier three if tier two is not working we always go back and say well what do they need and as a team approach we say do they need tier three and one of the things that we do is if they need a tier three and f if for some reason there is not a teacher trained in the tier three we don't say oh well we're going to offer that training in September we actually will offer that training right then because we're not going to wait um, until the next year to say okay well I think they need a tier three if we decide mid-year they need a tier three we're going to put in place what they need at that moment and we've done that we've done we did that last year and we have done things from you know individually to training teachers if we have the certification ourselves to um, good getting them into a national training to whatever that is um, so that students have what they need in the moment thing is we're not looking to have this replace any of the other Tier three, no, like you're not no, going to say 100% not. Okay. No. Um, and 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 we will always need a menu of support. And 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 while I can say great things about Read 180, it doesn't work for everyone. And so um, there's lots of things. And so I will never say, well, Read 180 is going to work for everyone that meets this kind of profile. 
Not really. And so that's our responsibility to say if it's not, it will work for a majority. And we know that we have the efficacy behind it. ESSA has said it is highly rated. It, it actually has a strong evidence base. And we also know that it's not going to work for everyone. And we need to know what are our other options if it's not working and that we're not going to let an entire year pass before we're like, oh, wait, that didn't work. We're not going to waste students time. And then from what you've heard from teachers and students, they like this program. They want to continue it. They don't see a need for an improvement or a change that this is what they want to continue doing. Yeah, and I think the, um, and so we offer um, two different um, tier two comprehension interventions at secondary. Um, and what I will tell you is that 36 of our secondary schools offer READ 180. Um, and so I think that just, and they get to select. So we will go and we'll say, so here is, you know, program A, READ 180, here's program B. And we'll talk about, you know, uh, that, you know, how they're structured, you know, what they need. And then schools get to select if they ha don't already have something in place, which tier two comprehension do we want um, and so the the topics are high interest and so when you say do the students love it I mean do students yeah. love being in reading intervention I mean I'm not gonna lie to you and say that's that, that maybe not um, however there are high interest topics and they are uh, they really do try to um, do real world connections so one of the things that they do obviously they have to publish a book and you know as soon as you publish you start to date things but what they do is for every single module they come up with things that have come that they have vetted that have come out in the news in the you know past month and so a teacher can go in and say okay well we're doing this on um, cyber security but and you know this was published two years ago but I can give you something that was published last week and so I think that there is a both and so no I don't think all of our students love being in reading intervention and I do think that there is high interest material and that there's enough choices um, and in a bonus um, thing in addition to trying to be engaging for students is it's building background knowledge for their science and their social studies classes so that when they get to that content they have seen it before they've built vocabulary they've built background knowledge which we like to think then will also increase their success when they're in their content classes yeah thank you other questions Ms. Stileski um, thank you so much for your dedication to reading you guys work extremely extremely hard um, I just have a question about the training and then the teachers that have completed it just based on need um, and obviously 135 hours of training is pretty intense. How many teachers do you need to complete the training? I'm just trying to figure out like what kind of scarcity there is for the students that need so, to get in this program. If I can just make one distinction. So when we are specifically referencing Wilson, there's a difference between the three-day training that we've trained. Um, that's the 32 number of teachers that have gone through that. The certification, which is an important distinction for those tier three interventions like Wilson, that's the 135 hours. And so um, it, that's just one thing to, to certainly understand. So we do make sure training, ideally, we, we would love to have more teachers go through 135 hours, but we also have to remember that's 135 hours. They're not in classrooms teaching really important um, evidence-based interventions. So um, last year, we were able to try to engage with teachers based on grant funding to offer, we were able to purchase eight seats mm -hmm. in the certification course, um, and we only had one taker. And some of that also, we just have to acknowledge teachers have a lot on their plate. And we're trying to support that in the last several years, as this board well knows, with teachers and everything else they're balancing. So we hope to continue to recruit teachers. Um, Dr. DiNato and Dr. Kraft and I, were talking about working with partners in HR about ways to incentivize teachers so that this becomes a value add in the system. Blueprint talks about the teacher career ladder and including opportunities for teachers to have within the system, opportunities for teacher leadership where they can actually have an opportunity to grow. Uh, so we think that might be another source, um, both of funding and potential for us to invest in that um, opportunity for full certification. In, in addition to that, I would just like to offer that uh, we have 37 secondary educators that have participated in letters, um, which is not Wilson certification, but it is on the science of reading and it is a very intense uh, course. 
Um, and so I think that's really exciting to say that, you know, while we might not have somebody, well, we have one, in the 135 hour certification, that we are continuing our journey of learning around learning science and how the brain learns to read. And so that's important. And so I think that sometimes we have to think about it in that it's not a binary, that we, so at NEO this year, every single teacher that came in that was, um, that is teaching a literacy intervention got an introduction to the science of reading, right? Just one step. But we said it's important enough that when they walk in the doors, we're going to say, let me tell you about the science of reading. Uh, we have the letters cohorts that are going on that we have encouraged secondary teachers, and we have already have 37 uh, teachers that have done that. And we have offered multiple opportunities in our professional study days that um, we have had over 167 uh, secondary educators participate in um, trainings around the science of reading. And so we are going to continue to put those things together. I'm going to continue to fill up those seven spots so that maybe in the future I'll be back here saying I need some more money so I can get more Wilson certification level one. Um, but you know, right now I think that's where we are and we continually look to improve and I um, continue to ask anybody that has had that initial three day training like has something changed? Would you like to be interested in that? And you know, we will continue to really try to get people that are in a place that they can do it and incentivize it. Like can we use the blueprint in our favor? Can we do what can we do to say like this is important and we want to recognize if you do 135 hours in something that you get recognition for that. Thank you. So do I have a motion to approve item? Oh, there's some more questions. Ms. Pumphrey? I just want to go back to something that um, Dr. Rogers mentioned. Um, you spoke about um, implementation and accountability and you specifically mentioned this year. So I just want to uh, be be sure that I'm clear. So what I'm hearing is that there are changes being made this year as far as implementation and accountability and implementation with fidelity. You heard that, that correct? absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you. And thank you for this presentation and a answering our questions. And I appreciate it at the Contracts Committee as well because we know we asked a lot. <laughs> um, it sounds as if we definitely need capacity in terms of offering these interventions to our students. and. Um, can you speak more as to what our challenges are with doing so? I'm hearing that we're not offering Orton-Gillingham, that there hasn't been a cohort in months. If teachers that are motivated and are interested in getting this, how do they go about it? Is it a funding issue? We're going into budget season. How can the board help get the right services to the right students and all students? I love that question, especially the way you framed it for help. I know Dr. Dinato was checking, but the first thing I want to, we, um, I would certainly say any teacher that's contacting you that's struggling, um, certainly always point them in our direction because we have not stopped Orton-Gillingham training. So I want to clarify that. Um, we have offered cohorts of up to 90 teachers a year for three years. It was a primary focus of the Maryland Leeds grant funding that you may recall. Um, so those are two different questions. I first just want to clearly state we have not stopped, nor will any funding detract from that plan. Um, so just so I can dispel that um, misunderstanding. But the second question about teachers that are interested, if they're not seeing the cohorts advertised or they need any additional support, certainly send them our way. Um, Dr. Dino, so, I'm sorry. Right, just to put some numbers behind that. So as of um, July 1, 2023, we had 150 licenses. Um, for 140 teachers to register for the training. So 120 uh, registered for Orton Gallingham Plus um, and 24, morpho 24 morphology. So we do have course availability for teachers. We do have funds to support that. Um, so it is absolutely moving forward. So again, but what I'm hearing though is what is our communication mechanism for staff to ensure that they are aware of training opportunities, how are we communicating with them, and that is just as important as making it available, is that they're aware of the availability. Thank you, and ensuring we have the capacity and that we can meet the demand where our students are. And I appreciate Dr. Kraft, you saying that we don't wait and to find out that something's not working because we know how important early if intervention is. If we still have is. a half a year, there's a lot that can be done in half a year. Um, and I just wanna, I know we're talking about secondary tonight, so the, those numbers sound really small, and I just wanna offer that uh, we have 338 elementary, and I know we're not talking about elementary, but I don't want you to walk away being like, that sounds like if you've been doing it for three years, um, just to, you know, we'll, and I know that you all have invited me back to talk about elementary, and I'd be happy to, but just to say that we do have 338 in the elementary that are trained. So um, we continue to want to increase the secondary, but there have been a substantial amount of 
um, educators trained in OG. And, you know, we really want to work it out, intervention um, to that those numbers we talked about in our intervention triangle, right? So at the secondary level that we have so few students in intervention because they've gotten what they needed in elementary and middle. By the time they get to high school, it's a, it's a handful. And Hopefully last you, to build capacity. some bigger numbers oh, to bring oh. back and, and it'll show because I think and hearing your um, the context and the implementation details really helps put this board put it into perspective because I do think we're asking for more data but you know until it's more widely implemented it's hard to you know those numbers just don't exist it sounds like right but when you're asking to increase oh, we have the spending a authority. solid plan this year. We, we have an amazing see. partnership um, on the school side with Dr. Jones, with Dr. Di Donato. Uh, we actually had a really exciting meeting today talking about just kind of a reset, right? And saying like, what is it we expect? How are we going to do it? And how are we going to partner together, knowing that curriculum and schools have to be braided together for students and teachers to benefit? And so um, I'm really invigorated. I'm excited, and I already see. I already see the steps in motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to get a roll call of vote on the motion to approve item N9. Do I have a motion to approve item N9? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation came from the committee. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempaul? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Dr. Savoy? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The contract thank you. passes. Thank you, and thanks for answering. If you think that was a lot of questions, you should have seen them at the curriculum committee. So <laughs> that was just a fraction of what we put them through the other day. Um, but it's very good discussion and um, definitely needed. The next item on the agenda is the report on academic achievement 2023 opening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Jones, Chief of Schools, Dr. D. Donato, Chief Academic Officer, and Mr. McCall, Chief Human Resources Officer, to the table. We can start with the first slide. I want to thank the board for the opportunity to provide a report on the opening of schools, um, truly speaking to our four identified priorities. First slide, please. As everyone is aware, we've identified our most urgent priorities across Team BCPS. In order to prioritize our student needs and move forward, we must focus on academic achievement, highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff, safety and climate in schools and offices, and an infrastructure that increases efficiency. Next slide, please. If we take a deeper look at academic achievement, we have identified four focus areas for this school year. English language arts, mathematics, ESOL, and special education. We must commit to engaging professional development for all of our teachers, professional development focused on content, focused on leadership, and data analysis so that we can respond to the needs of our students. We will also continue to move forward with best practices and Dr. Jones will speak about the books and the resources that we are using as leaders across Team BCPS to move forward and implement evidence-based strategies in our schools. We must implement curriculum with fidelity. That includes following pacing 
and making sure that all students have the opportunity to participate in our curriculum-based assessments so we are able to determine their progress and opportunities for us at central office and at the schools to meet the needs of our students in real time, not for future students, but the students that sit in the classes in front of us. And lastly, the data analysis that needs to happen in schools as well as in central offices requires that we all engage in high quality practices that reflect high expectations for all students. And so our next slide really speaks to how we're going to do the work. This is not new information for Team BCPS. This is our theory of action in all things that we do. We endeavor to make sure that we are embracing and engaging all stakeholders to speak to their experiences, to speak to the needs in authentic collaboration, empowering them to speak freely, and also to be part of the problem solving. And only if we are both engaging and empowering a variety of stakeholders will we, will we be able to move forward and ensure that our students and staff and ultimately Baltimore County Public Schools is able to excel. And so at this time, I turn it over to our Chief Academic Officer to share some of the work of Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Okay, if you could put the slide back up, that would be great. All right, fantastic. So within the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, as you can see, there are four departments, teaching and learning that you've got to um, meet with uh, Ms. Shea earlier this evening, academic programs and options, our Department of Special Education, and our Ac Department of Academic Services. Together, the effective implementation of curriculum, the provision of academic programs and options, and services to support individual students at schools within the community and throughout their elementary through secondary uh, experience. Our goal is to identify and develop this culturally responsive curriculum and instruction for the students ensure that we are consistently supporting implementing high quality implement, uh, curriculum. And I think that's been a recursing theme, re recurring theme that you've heard this evening about the consistent implementation of curriculum, providing meaningful outcomes and um, outcome-based professional learning. Again, measuring the effectiveness of our professional learning. Are we providing staff with the training that they need so that we are seeing the outcomes in the classroom that we want to see with our students? And then examining data to evaluate the implementation of curriculum. So that's not only looking at our student achievement data, that's looking at observational data from our school administrators within school buildings. So that again, we are looking at the quality of the professional development that we're providing and how to continuously support teachers so that they can better instruct and support our students. Next slide. Focusing on the four academic areas uh, that Dr. Rogers just shared with us, academic achievement for English language arts. We've heard a lot about our secondary uh, need to support our striving readers. Um, this gives you some information about our elementary students. As you know, we implemented uh, HMH into reading this school year. On the slide, you can see that about approximately 82% of our uh, elementary students, elementary teachers participated in the initial getting started professional learning as of August 22nd, as well as about 80% of our teachers participating in the second training, which is prioritize, plan, and pace your instruction. While we do not have 100% of our teachers participating, we absolutely have identified that as a need. It, on September 15th, as well as September 25th, teachers will have the opportunity to complete those trainings if they have not done so thus far. While the September 15th professional study day is a school-based professional study day, many administrators have selected to utilize that time to ensure those teachers who were unable to attend the training or who were hired late will have that opportunity at that time. Additionally, we are using um, Amira Learning, which is a screening tool. It's part of um, HMH to identify potential skill gaps in the five pillars of reading and to ensure that we are providing intervention for our youngest students immediately and quickly so that we can intervene and we are stopping the progression of our students moving to secondary schools who are reading below grade level. We are also providing professional development to our reading specialists to ensure that those people who are in the schools supporting our students and supporting our teachers have the same high quality professional development and continue to support the teachers as they continue to grow in their content knowledge. Next slide. 
Academic Achievement in Esau, again, another initiative that you saw that's come to fruition this school year is the decentralization of our Esau centers. On the screen, you'll see a list of the schools that um, began welcoming back their neighborhood students for the 23-24 school year. Part of that process was ensuring that those schools were provided with high quality professional development so that the teachers understood different pedagogical approaches that they needed to support English language learners within their classroom. Two focal areas for us were something uh, called SIOP, which is Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol, that really talks about different instructional strategies and pedagogy that can be used not only in ESAW classes, but also throughout all content areas. We were very glad to see that not only did ESAW teachers at these schools attend the training, but all schools had at least 50% of their teachers attend day one of the SIOP training, which is, again, showing the commitment of all teachers within the school to embrace their multilingual learners as they're returning to their neighborhood schools. We've also provided professional development and training on Elevation, which is a data platform that not only provides information as far as a student's English language proficiency levels, but the skills that you can expect them to do based on those English language proficiency skills so that we can look at where are students now, what skills should they be able to demonstrate consistently in the classroom, and then what are those skills we need to strive and push them towards based on the WIDA Can Do statements, which is the assessment tool that we use. Elevation also provides modules of professional development for teachers so they can even extend their professional learning beyond just the base training. Um, we've also provided paid opportunities for teachers if they would like to participate in that, uh, those additional training modules after the school day. Um, again, exciting data points with over 80% of our uh, staff in these schools completing the uh, primary elevation training. So again, that is showing a holistic approach of a school to really welcome and embrace their students back to their neighborhood schools. Academic achievement in math. We're going to look a little bit at our secondary math. As you know, Algebra 1 is an area of very big focus for us. The consistent high quality implementation of illustrative math is going to be a continued focus for this school year. While it was implemented last school year, we do understand that there is a need for ongoing training that also provides the follow-up training to our school administrators so that when they are visiting classrooms and providing that instructional feedback that is consistent with the pedagogical approaches identified within the curriculum. On the screen, you'll see some of the trainings that have been provided already, um, as well as some next steps that we're taking. So this summer, we offered our Algebra One Academy on Professional Study Day, which was our system-wide professional development day on August 22nd during the first duty week for teachers, all math um, teachers who teach either math in grades six, seven, eight, algebra one, geometry, or algebra two were provided with professional development on the use of illustrative math. Additionally, our math teachers have monthly department chair meetings. So again, building the knowledge and skills of all staff within the school, so those teachers that are working directly with students, the department chairs who are teaching courses and working directly with students, but who can also then support their teachers as well as the school administrators. Dr. Rogers also mentioned our focus on monitoring curriculum-based assessment implementation and the data analysis. So if we see that students in a certain section or a certain math course are not making progress, what are we doing about it, both centrally as well as at the schoolhouse? So are we then looking at the instructional implementation? Are we looking back at our professional learning catalog to see have teachers attended multiple trainings or did they just go to one maybe last year and we need to redo some things to support them with supporting their students? So really looking at the data across uh, variables, so not just the, the quantitative, but the qualitative of what we see happening within the classroom. Next slide. Okay, academic achievement and special education. So our Office of Special Education embarked on a strategic planning um, goal for this summer where they really looked at um, identifying both three-year and five-year priorities to enhance our services to students with um, who receive special education services. Part of this process was really unpacking some of the challenges that Baltimore County has historically faced with providing special education services and acknowledging that, and then identifying what are our next steps to move forward. Focusing on three areas, people, services, and culture. So again, a 
looking at the professional development that we're providing to teachers. So are we providing them with training that is helping them feel confident in the classroom, that's providing with the strategies that they need to work with the students that they're serving? and so that they can continue to make progress with students. So special educators have a unique job and role because it's not just teaching the students within the classroom, it's also working with families in the team process, developing IEPs, understanding goals and objectives for students. So it is a two-pronged training approach, so it's not just a content and pedagogy, but it also is those other administrative responsibilities that come with the role of a special educator. Looking at our services and resources that we're providing to students, so how are we providing consistent services and supports to students? Again, one of the points that came up this evening with the closure of Camp Field was how are we going to continue to provide those consistent services and supports to students once they leave Camp Field and go back to their neighborhood schools? This would be part of our services and our commitment to provide consistent services no matter what school a student attends within Baltimore County. And looking at the culture, so what are we doing? And this goes back sort of to the camp field discussion. What are we doing to create that culture of welcoming and embracing our students into our schools, welcoming their families, ensuring that parents feel like they do have a voice, whether they're participating in IEP team meeting or coming to register their student or coming to observe in the classroom. So they are very focused on these three areas. You can see some of the performance goals. They've identified measurable outcomes for themselves that they're going to continue to monitor throughout the school year. Both looking at surveys from special educators with regards to do they feel supported, what are the trainings that they need, as well as looking at um, are we looking at outcomes for students um, meeting those expectations. So working together in continued partnership, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Dr. Jones, to talk about the division of schools. Uh, thank you, Dr. DiGiannato, and good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to talk about the work of the Division of Schools. This summer, we participated in a leadership retreat, and our focus was really around our core work and how that work aligns with our four, our four priorities. Um, one of the things that we're really focusing on in the Department of Schools is growing our principals as instructional leaders. And what Dr. Rogers has done is allocated the funding and the resources to support what the research says about um, effective principal supervision and support. So we've reduced the number uh, or the span of control, as the research refers to, of schools that our principal supervisors or executive directors, and I'll use that term interchangeably, um, are responsible are responsible before. And in doing so, we used research from the Wallace Foundation, the Center for Educational Leadership, and just best practices for school improvement, which we'll talk about. With that being said, our current structure, as I stated, reduces the number of schools, um, the assigned schools to executive directors, but we also have a, um, a, a network that we're referring to, a network of um, school improvement and support that um, one of our executive directors actually is building a team around to make sure that our schools that have been identified locally and or as it relates to CSI and TSI get the differentiated supports that, that they need. Um, we'll also talk about organizational development and leadership on this slide. As we know, um, one of the core tenets or priorities is highly effective um, teachers, leaders, and staff. And so we're really working to kind of uh, make visible and align our supports. We talked about that a little bit earlier around building our teachers' capacity, but also thinking about what is it that our leaders need in this moment to be able to do some of this um, continuous improvement work and turnaround work. So we're looking at all of our schools um, in terms of the work that can be accomplished, and we're very excited about that. You'll also see on the slide, um, through a restructure of support and um, supervision to school that we have our social emotional supports, we have school safety, and we have Office of Athletics, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Next slide, please. So here you have the two books that um, Dr. Rogers referred to earlier, Schools That Succeed and Districts That Succeed, and there are several great nuggets within these, um, these books, and we've had um, a very, very great response in terms of educators throughout the school system still calling the office for books as early as today because there are just some practical tidbits in the book. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight for us to really consider is these research-based research essentials that align with the four priorities. We know, and the research says, that if we have effective le leaders, collaborative teachers around teaching and learning, ambitious instruction or a viable curriculum, and we have family engagement, the book refers to it as involvement. I like to use our 
our term around engagement and then this idea of safe and supportive environments, then we can really think about um, organizational coherence and or research-based strategies that bring about um, school, imp school improvement. And this summer, in addition to our leadership retreat, we made sure that the time that we had together pr with principals was really spent on meaningful meaningful work and, and the right work. So we're constantly going to be saying, and you're going to hear us say, what does the research say? What do the evidence-based practices say? And how do we shift um, and really create this paradigm shift within the school system just around what we know works for all of our students, whether our students need support with reading, whether they're on grade level. And we had a conversation uh, more recently about how are we continuing to pr push some of our high-performing students. So we're doing that again through um, through book studies and or um, these practical practical principles. I did want to highlight that this summer, um, we had about 900, 900 teachers go through NEO, and we're really excited about that. We were grateful and, and excited about meeting with our sixth and ninth graders to give them some um, practices just around orientation and getting to know um, their schools. We're really looking at, as, as everyone knows, six, nine, and of course, even 10th grade, just what's happening in those, in those grades. We believe with this renewed fo focus in our work over the summer and through the opening of schools, that if we provide high-quality high support to schools, if we establish a common vision and mission, mission for our goals, focusing on academic excellence and e educational equity, that we will be able to use the data to make some informed decisions of, for our students. And one of the key tenets of school improvement is really implementing intervention strategies. So I was very excited about the conversation that took place earlier as someone who actually um, led the work of Re 180 in a, previous, um, in a previous school setting. So we're excited about, again, new principals, new assistant principals, and the aspiring work that is being accomplished in our schools. Next slide, please. I'll quickly go through this. Um, I feel like Ms. Lichter um, actually presented this slide in the sense of um, this idea of here for an attendance campaign. Just very, very, also very excited again about the research-based foundational tenets of this program, which is aligned to a lot of the attendance works um, work that is out there. And so I'm not going to kind of go into that or much further into that, except for the fact that we are very excited that not only are our schools accountable for what's happening with our students in terms of chronic absenteeism and attendance, but we're also holding ourselves as central office leaders accountable to that, to that support. I want to highlight on this slide, too, our, our focus app for mental health resources. We do believe in the importance of making sure that our students get exactly what they need, and the Department of Social-Emotional Supports, which also focuses on health and wellness, is committed to creating a culture of positive school attendance through the here through the Here For It attendance campaign, but also thinking about those um, programs that speak to the health and um, mental uh, wellness of our, of our students. I don't want to forget about um, athletics in this moment. We are very excited to have athletics in the division of schools. I am learning more and more and more about sports and, and just the, the, ambitions, the ambitions and the, um, the goals of our student athletes. So I'm very excited about having uh, Mr. Sai and his team and the athletic programs. Next slide, please. Safe and supportive environments. Um, the Safe Schools Conference was another um, big success this year. We had 700, um, student, 700 administrators this summer um, go through the program, including teachers, school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists, athletic directors, and school resource officers. In terms of safety assistance or student safety as assistance, we've been able to add um, an expanded amount of um, safety assistance to our elementary schools, and in total we have 27 elementary schools that have been um, able to experience the, um, the offerings of our student safety assistance. As we know, we have our SRO program, and I also want to highlight, which is not on the slide, this um, coming together around the code of conduct and revising the conduct in a way that, again, creates that coherence, that consistency, and we were able to present those updates to our, our, leaders, um, our leaders this summer. You have the slide, the slide bef before you, so there are so many things that, again, are happening. I did want to highlight the fact that we are looking at resources and grants to be able to fund some of our um, safety initiatives and programs. Uh, grants have been submitted for a hate crimes grant, a safe schools grant, and then school safety grant, um, which is a, a, a programmatic grant to make sure our schools are safe. 
Uh, last but not least on the slide, I want to highlight the Omni Alert, which is the weapons detection that we know is going to um, um, be something that we are very excited about and um, is being rolled out beginning with high school, middle school, and elementary school. Um, I could go on and on and on about all the work that we're doing in the Department of Schools, but I am going to turn it over to you, Mr. McCall, so that you can take it from here, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jones, and good evening again, board members and superintendent. Uh, this slide shows the number of new hires by employee groups represented in each of our bargaining units. Uh, that would be that of CASE, ESBBC, uh, ASME, uh, and TAPCO. This year, as of September 8th, 2023, we've hired 15 principals, uh, 35 assistant principals, 845 point six, and that would be FTE uh, teachers, 45 paraeducators, 30 uh, office professionals, 15, excuse me, 16.5 bus drivers and 23 bus driver trainees, and then also 31 uh, cafeteria workers. Next slide, please. When we compare the number of vacancies from last, this time last year, we see that the number of teacher and cafeteria worker vacancies decreased by more than half. Specifically, you see that the number of teacher vacancies in early September of 2022 was at 360.4, as compared to our current teacher vacancies of 173.1. In addition, there were 142 cafeteria worker vacancies in September of 2022, as compared to that of 63. Furthermore, we had 95 bus driver vacancies in September of 2022, as compared to 59.5 in September of 2023, which represents a 37% reduction. Please note that even though a lot of work has been done this past summer, a lot of work still continues. And with that said, we're working diligently to hire highly qualified individuals to fill our remaining vacancies system-wide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the second half of our presentation. I'd like to call up our Chief of Staff, Ms. Charlie Green, Director of Communications, Ms. Boyende Onijala, Chief Information Officer, Mr. Pedro Augusto, and Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Jess Grimm. Good evening. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, Superintendent Rogers, we are excited to follow our esteemed colleagues and to share the work that's been happening uh, as we do community outreach with our families. You've heard Dr. Rogers say several times that it's going to take all of us to be able to achieve the goals that we have for our system. And it was really um, comforting also to hear um, Dr. Jones talk about what the research says about community engagement and the importance of it. Uh, the work that we do in the Department of Communications isn't just something that's nice to do, it is vital and a critical part of making sure that we see the change we expect to see in Baltimore County Public Schools. So while the focus of this presentation is on the opening of schools, um, I'm here with the Director of Communications, Boyende, uh, Boyende Onijala, to talk about all the work that came before we opened schools. Uh, this summer, the Department of Communications held a number of events in preparation for the school year. If you could kindly go back one slide. There we go. Okay. So um, over the summer and throughout the spring, uh, our superintendent has held 10 Meet the Superintendent events. And so our Department of Communications was there at all of those events, facilitating those meetings, and also capturing the feedback from our community and making sure that we are using that as we make decisions moving forward. Our superintendent has held two media avails. She's made herself available to the press, and that will be a monthly occurrence. That is the work of our communications team, reaching out to our media partners, because our goal is to tell our own story and not be reactionary and allow people to tell our story for us. In addition to that, we held a partnership fair where we brought the largest number of partners together uh, with many of our school-based staff. We were able to make critical connections that we know are going to support the work that's going on in schools. The team launched the uh, Back to BCPS campaign where we communicated prior to the start of school critical information that was going to be necessary for parents and students to understand what expectations were as they walked through those school doors on the first day of school. Uh, we certainly supported the 
human resources campaign to engage in recruitment efforts and to make sure that we were trying to not only attract a highly qualified staff, but also to communicate with people inside of Team BCPS about opportunities that are available so they could share that information. That information was also shared with lawmakers as well as our county partners who were able to post and share that information on our behalf. And then we certainly were very proud to have the largest number of participants at BCPS Fest than we've had in past years. Uh, the event continues to grow and continues to be an exciting way to start the school year. And you also know that our superintendent shared information about uh, Budget 101, which is something that is coming soon to our website and will be part of an ongoing series of information that goes out to the public to make sure that we are engaging and empowering them so they can lend their voice to these vital processes. So that's just a little bit of a sneak peek into the work that led to the start of school and that will continue. As I said, those monthly press conferences, Budget uh, 101, ongoing opportunities to engage with the super, uh, superintendent, you may look forward to those upcoming, but at this time, I will turn it over to the Director of Communications to share a little bit about why we are focusing on these efforts and how they fit in with our long-term strategic plan for communications and community engagement in BCPS. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Next slide, please. Good evening, members of the board. Last May, we presented information to the board on a system-wide communications plan that is aligned with the goals outlined in our strategic plan and addresses the findings and recommendations in the efficiency review specific to the communication needs of the system. And so, for the last year, the ongoing work of the Department of Communications and Community Outreach to support schools and offices and engage with Team BCPS, the Team BCPS community, has focused on the five focus areas that you see on the screen outlined in our system-wide strategic communications plan. Those areas are improving accessibility for stakeholders, enhancing parent, staff, and community engagement and strengthening communications, expanding direct outreach to students, enhancing central office collaboration, and cultivating stronger interagency partnerships. So for the first, first focus area of improving accessibility for stakeholders, this focus area really has been about rethinking the mechanisms and platforms for outreach that allow more people to engage with critical system content as efficiently as possible. Additionally, we've been taking a deeper look at how we differentiate our messages and adjust our content across various platforms to meet the needs of a very diverse Team BCPS community. A significant part of this work and one area that I am extremely proud of um, has been the redesign of the BCPS website. We heard clearly from the community, staff, families, that the former website design was not working. People could not find information. You would go type something in the search box and you would get results for something that you didn't search for. Um, and so we heard loud and clear that it wasn't working. And so the first phase of our redesign work has included the BCPS homepage and the landing pages for the main menu content. We have a new newsroom that provides a one-stop shop for all things community and staff messages, press releases, the team BCPS newsletter, staff newsletter, and more. The second phase of the website re redesign which we are wrapping up, um, includes division and offices fa office fa um, pages. The third and final phase of the project will include school sites. So when completed, we are excited that the new BCPS website, office pages, and school websites will be easier to navigate and will provide Team BCPS with timely, important information about our school system and schools. I'm also pleased to share that since our last presentation to the board, we launched a new effort to enhance community access to board meetings, community meetings, virtual town halls, the conversations that we've had around safety, and more with the use of Swagit Productions. This, this is a full service meeting, streaming, and video management system. With Swagit, we're able to embed live streaming videos directly on our homepage and run content from BCPS TV 24 seven online. So so if you're up late at night and want to see some BCPS TV programming, you can go right to our website and get engage with that content right there. And in a post-pandemic world, we know that the public has grown to expect live streamed and recorded public meetings from local government agencies and school systems. And so what, what, what have we seen as a result of this? Increased engagement, we're talking hundreds of people tuning into our virtual town halls, engaging with us in the chat to share their comments, to share their feedback. We're seeing more precise closed captions and greater reliability. 
For the next area, focus area of enhancing parent, staff, and community engagement, the previous slide, please. And strengthening communications. So here we're providing more targeted outreach to parents, staff, and the community by leveraging underutilized and new communication tools. This includes the weekly staff newsletter that we launched last school year. We're really excited about that. A bi-weekly community newsletter that is shared with Team BCPS via social media, and a new partnership newsletter that highlights the work and impact of our more than 700 Team BCPS partners. We're leveraging text messages via school messenger and alerts via the parent focus portal and Schoology. In our review of system communication needs, it was evident that these tools had not been utilized to their full internal and external communications potential. Now, a significant part of that work to enhance engagement and strengthen communications has been building engagement with Spanish-speaking families through traditional media, digital media, collaboration with county agencies, nonprofit organizations, and more. We have more than 11,000 English learners in BCPS, and more than 20,000 BCPS students have identified themselves as speaking another language. Of that 20,000, 11,000 of those students speak Spanish. From 2016 to 2021, the percentage of Spanish-speaking EL students grew from 55 to 68 percent. We want to ensure that we are meeting the communication needs of this rapidly growing population and providing timely, culturally responsive resources and information. And so, over the last year, we've created a new T uh, BCPS TV program called Televisión BCPS, where we unpack important system programs, initiatives, policies and rules, and resources for Spanish-speaking students and families. Topics have included community schools, the SRO program, ESOL, understanding what resources are available to families, and much more. Even homework. How do I help my child? Families want that help, and so we want to provide it to them in the language that they speak at home. Noticieros PCPS, short informational videos for social media and the website that provide highlights of things to know for the week, for the month. Again, this could be understanding uh, our free meals program. This could be understanding parent-teacher conferences, how to prepare, what to expect. Uh, we've created a more robust Spanish Facebook page where we provide not only important system information, but also connect the community to timely resources. Vocabulario BCPS, where we provide what we call functional terminology for newly arriving families and students. It breaks down what we call our edu-speak to everyday lingo for these families and students. Help them unpack these frequently used terms. When they hear IEP, when they hear these other things, you get confused, your eyes kind of glaze over, like there's so many terms. We want to help you understand. Focus groups for Spanish-speaking parents where they can share what they need from the school system as it relates to engagement and communication. We're providing live simultaneous interpretation at system events to ensure greater access. I believe it was our um, Meet the Superintendent event at Dundalk Sollers Point where the majority of families in the room were actually Spanish-speaking families. And so that was really encouraging to see that the word was getting out, they were coming out because we were able to provide that live simultaneous interpretation in their native language. The next area of expanding direct outreach to students. So we've been focused on utilizing our tools to communicate directly with students, soliciting their feedback, and providing information on system initiatives, programs, and events that we know are important to them and their peers. We have provided opportunities for two-way conversations with leadership, and we'll continue to do so for Dr. Rogers' administration, because our purpose is ensuring student success. And students want to have those frequent opportunities to share what is working, what needs improvement, and how they can be a part of that change. They want to be effective ambassadors for Team BCPS. Dr. Rogers shared with students over the summer that she intends on creating a student advisory council where they can share their thoughts, ideas, and hopes for the school system. Last school year, we held 18 focus group meetings with students and the former BCPS SMA, Baroa Hassan. Our team participated in 24 student-focused school visits and made 11 new student-centered partnership connections. Our student focus groups allowed us to gather information about student perspectives on school engagement. In June, we launched our first 
student questionnaire. It won't be the last, because we want to hear from the students. Um, and here we were asking them, what does engagement mean to you? What are some of the barriers you're running into when you're trying to participate in extracurricular activities? So of course, we learned about things like transportation, or I'm leaving school to go work, or I have to take care of younger siblings. We asked them, what do you want to see? What types of activities? So we got a lot of great information. And mind you, we launched this in June. It was close to the end of the school year, so we're like, okay, let's see what happens. Nearly 2,500 students responded. And so we're really excited that for our first effort in getting information directly from students, we got a lot of positive feedback. And we shared campaigns and other information with students via Schoology and have had an overwhelmingly positive response. Sh students have reached out to share their appreciation for the information that we've been posting. I've even had students approach me at the Meet the Superintendent events when I share my name. They're like, oh, you sent me a message on Schoology. Yes, I did. Thank you for reading it. They've been really excited. We've had parents come up and say, thank you so much for telling us about the board of sel uh, selected students. My daughter was able to apply and she was accepted. We had never heard of this initiative before. Now, these are things that schools are sharing, that we're sharing centrally, but for whatever reason, they were tuned into Schoology and they were able to get that information that they otherwise may have missed. So that was really encouraging to hear that these efforts and these communications are reaching our students. Enhancing central office uh, collaboration. For this focus area, we've been working to establish processes that enable stronger cross-office, cross-division collaboration and identification of critical areas of communication for the system. So many of the things that you heard our colleagues talk about earlier from the division of schools, from curriculum and instruction, as we're receiving that information, we're working together to ensure that it actually is shared with Team BCPS. And so as a result, we're developing clearer messages, resources, and other deliverables that equip offices and schools to also serve as effective ambassadors. Our team provides professional development on effective communications, standards of excellence for executive leadership, principals, assistant principals, staff development teachers, support staff, and other aspiring leaders. I provide personal uh, um, ongoing media and crisis communications training for BCPS administrators and leaders. And we believe that through the continued conversations and trainings, we will continue to build shared understanding, shared commitments, shared values that will guide our work moving forward as a system. And so for the final focus area of cultivating stronger interagency partnerships, we believe that improved collaboration with the county government, government, local government agencies, and nonprofit partners enables us to provide timely and accurate communication in crisis, amplify core messaging, and leverage resources to improve community engagement. As a result of these efforts, we have seen a significant increase in the number of community service providers that are contacting us, reaching out to us, wanting to partner with us, wanting to be at our events, wanting to have a table, because they know that that's the best way to connect with our families. We're working closely with the county's immigration Affairs Outreach Coordinator to identify services and enhance outreach to immigrant families. We're a part of the county's New American Advisory Group. We're learning more about the various agencies and the work that they do and how we can kind of bridge the gap for our families. Um, we have been zipping around the county Check out our new parent mobile coming to an event near you. We're really excited. Um, setting up tables, having the parent mobile go out to provide information and resources. We even traveled to Annapolis to show support for a bill that focuses on English learners and dual language immersion programs. And joining in with the members of the Latino Legislative Caucus, Casa de Maryland, and Comité Latino, we were only one of two school systems that were represented there. So again, we're getting out into the community and working with our partners to ensure that we can provide the best information and services to our families. We're also working with the Department of Parks and Recreation to provide timely workshops for immigrant families as they work to build a community garden. So in all areas, we're there. We have our hands in everything. We're sharing information across various platforms because we know the more information our families have, our students have, the more empowered they feel, the more engaged that they are. And I'm also pleased to share that for the first time, we have brought together Comité Latino, uh, a, a advocacy group for Spanish-speaking families, for students, and the NAACP Baltimore County Chapter for joint conversations and to brainstorm forward-looking solutions on how we can use unite forces and work together to meet the needs of African American and Latino students and families. Next slide, please. So 
There are great things happening in Team BCPS. We are proud that we have just a small part of the honor in sharing that information with our community, uh, with our staff, with our students. BCPS offers multiple ways to stay connected and to be informed about important news and information from the website and various social media platforms to our community newsletter and much more. We understand in this day and age everyone's overwhelmed by all the information coming at them from different directions. So we've heard that feedback and what we've done is created a one-stop shop where you can get all the information, figure out what are the best ways to stay connected with the system, and that is our Stay Connected webpage. And so it has all of the tools, all of the platforms that we're currently on. Uh, there's an easy QR code, you scan it, it takes you right to that Stay Connected page. Not only do we have it in English, we also have it in Spanish, just highlighting again, once again, all of the resources that we have for multilingual uh, families. Um, and this information has been shared with all schools and with Team BCPS. So our team is excited about the work ahead and committed to building community through effective communication and engaging students, parents, staff, and community members to support student success. Thank you very much, and I think I'm turning it over to Dr. Grimm. Communications folks are tough to follow, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so next slide, please. So in operations, the Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning completed the process of thoroughly cleaning the inside spaces of all of our schools and the preventative maintenance of mechanical systems was completed prior to school opening for all of our schools, centers, and programs. Site beautification and improvement work was completed as scheduled for school opening. Logistics transferred over 48,000 pieces of materials from schools and offices. Security improvements were also completed at several schools this summer. Additionally, facilities has expanded the food waste compost program and has publicized a green schools guidebook in addition to preparing for a few upcoming boundary studies. In the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, we began the Community Eligibility Program, CEP, where all students have access to breakfast and lunch free of charge every day. The Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, FFVP, increased from 27 to 50 schools this year. This grant-funded program provides elementary schools with unique fresh fruits and vegetables in the classroom environment. The new pre-K program aligns curriculum with fruits and vegetables. So during the week that students are learning the letter A, for example, we will deliver apples to the classroom as a snack along with educational materials. Both programs promote the consumption and exposure of fresh produce at a young age, which has proven to establish better eating habits as students grow older. OFNS served almost 361,000 meals in the first week of school, which was a 25% increase over last year. The Office of Transportation managed over 3,750 3, phone calls via the Pulaski Park Communication Center, as well as received and responded to over 850 transportation contact us emails during the first week of school. Additionally, staff responded to 292 bus stop requests during the first week of school. The Office of Transportation continues to publish bus changes and delays on the BCPS website for AM and PM service, and thankfully those delays have been relatively few these first few weeks of school. Transportation is also excited to be training school staff on busware, the bus tracking application supported by the board that will allow stakeholders to view bus arrival to stop in real time. This initiative is on schedule for system-wide rollout to parents and guardians during the last week of September. It'll be available for them beginning October the 2nd, which I believe is a Monday. In the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment, staff conducted 28 school visits during the first week of school. DRAA provided data literacy, professional learning, and support this summer to 111 schools and work with 32 offices on the continuous improvement process, in addition to hosting 16 Power Inform and Performance Matters trainings this summer. Next slide, please. The Division of Operations is proud of our service for Team BCPS as we strive to continuously improve our practice. 
this slide shows some of our service to schools and students. Um, we've got a shout out to our bus team transporting some of our staff. Um, look at those delicious vent, uh, bento boxes um, and some of the other food layout as well as the amazing work from our facilities team in prepping our school buildings um, for their opening. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Augusto. Thank you. Uh, good evening. So what I wanted to do is um, just mention we've been pretty busy. We were busy over the summer preparing, oh, next slide, please. No, oh, that's, oh, that's it, sorry. Uh, we're busy preparing uh, to support schools to leveraging technology and improve business services uh, to make sure that we could um, as efficiently open schools as possible. So with that said, devices, we refreshed approximately 48,000 devices, uh, the pre-K to five. Um, those are devices, Chromebooks, that the students will be able to take with them as they progress through uh, the grades. Um, we also began the refresh initiative for the over 18,000 staff devices. We'll have that through uh, completed by mid-year. And then also, we spend a lot of time planning uh, working with the schools, looking at enrollment numbers, figuring out how much spare equipment would be needed in, uh, to accommodate broken devices. And if I want to put this in context, uh, how successful we were. We had, in the first two weeks, we had 912 uh, tickets for additional devices. But if you look at that over the 111,000 students, we had a success rate of 99.18% of students that have that had devices day one uh, during the start, start of school. So I'm very happy with that number. Uh, the next item is with students. And I'm very proud to say that we've expanded the youth employment program beyond the summer. Uh, so currently we have uh, 12 of our students that um, participated in the program over the summer. They're now supporting our help desk and device repair shop. This is an opportunity, the, the, the youth employment program is uh, for us an, uh, an opportunity to expose students to the IT field. And I, as I mentioned before, I'm very proud that we've expanded this for throughout the full year. Um, the other thing we did over the summer is we launched the Focus mobile app. So this app allowed or allows family members to connect and engage with their students' learning. And to date, um, we've had well over 18,000 downloads of the application. And as the school year progresses, we do anticipate that number to increase. And finally, with Help Desk, we did spend the summer evaluating our Help Desk delivery services, figuring out what we could do to improve without adding additional staff. And um, we were able to handle this, the rush of um, tickets and calls that came in during the first couple of weeks of, of the school, um, keeping our average hold times to under three minutes, and also um, right around the 50% mark of addressing issues um, during the first contact, so without having to escalate it to any of our tier two or tier three support. So we were able to give uh, the people that called in answers and get them moving um, with that initial contact. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Ergo. So at this time, I would like to invite Mr. McCall, Dr. Jones, and Dr. DiDonato back to the table. I um, want to share with the board, this is our work. This is what we've been up to, been up to this summer and the first few weeks of school. Um, I want to thank the team for all of their hard work. This is a team that is truly collaborative, um, really focused on the needs of our students on a regular basis and works together to be responsive to schools at the speed of schools and would invite any board members with any uh, comments or questions uh, to ask those questions at this time. So, wow. So if anybody says, what are we doing in BCPS, we tell them to watch tonight's board meeting and watch that report, and all their questions will be answered. So first, thank you for putting together, and thank you for everything you did to ensure that we had a successful start to the school year. Are there um, any questions from board members? Ms. Frimpong? That was a fantastic presentation from all of you, um, helping us to understand 
all the work that you guys have put in to make um, us off to a great school year. So um, my question is an academic one. Um, okay, so <laughs> the, the question is, you were talking about some check-ins as far as um, just that you're gonna be evaluating throughout the school year, right, instead of waiting until the end. What is the frequency or consistency that those um, check-ins will be or evaluations will be, and what's, what is being used to do those evaluations? So a couple of different things. So we do have um, assessments that we give throughout the school year at different grade levels. We use MAP as one of the indicators. So really looking at that, we do a fall, winter, and spring administration um, for grade levels one through five, and then kindergarten begins in fall and spring. We also have our curriculum-based assessments that we do throughout at the end of each unit. So again, those give depending on how long a unit is, and that varies across content and across grades, but it does give benchmarks along the way for us to monitor those things. As far as the, what was, we spoke about earlier with interventions, there are intervention monitoring periods depending on what students are using. So if it is in our primary grade levels and we're using a mirror to provide some additional support for phonics instruction, um, that's gonna look different than the reading intervention time periods of monitoring for READ 180. So part of it is really looking at our full scope of assessments that we give and checking in with schools at each interval and that's working really collaboratively with Dr. Jones and her team with the executive directors of schools because we're focusing on the content. We're going to help provide them the support so that they're also working um, with the school administrators and our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment so that we are clearly all working together to look at that data at the various points of when it's administered. So it's throughout the school year, but it varies depending on the content, the grade level, and the assessment tool that we're using. Is there a specific follow-up? Is there a specific incremental level that you'll be looking for? For example, so are there gonna be goals or anything set maybe for as a class, as individuals, and we're looking for one, two percent, whatever it is, but percent increases so we can know we may not be where we wanna be, but we are making this progress. I think um, MAP, because it's a standardized assessment, is one of the indicators that we look at the percentage of students who are meeting the 61st percentile or above. Um, school set targets based on that. Um, my goal is that all of our students are meeting or exceeding that. So our, our goal is 100%. Um, we are going to work to do that because as a school system, our job is to educate students and we need to do that with all of our students. Um, and if we're not doing it, then we need to look at what we are doing with them. So while I can say, yes, there's gonna be incremental goals, but our goal is that all of our students are making progress. Thank you. Other, Ms. Booker-Dwyer? So I just want to say, wow, like this looks different. This feels different. This is encouraging. This is powerful. And so if, if anyone, I agree with the chair that if anyone has any question about where the direction that Baltimore County Public Schools is going in, all they have to do is just look at this cabinet, look at the leadership and just you could really see this. Um, I wrote like, I don't know, like a, two pages of like things that I liked that you all said, questions. So I'm not gonna go over all my questions. Um, I'm not gonna do that, because I know there'll be others, so I'll just kind of save them. Um, you know, following up on um, what Ms. Frimpong says, you know, just about the baseline data and the target data, like when we can see that. And just knowing, you know, I loved with the communication when we were talking about, um, you know, reaching everyone and just how do you know that you're, you're getting there and, and work. So I love that. I loved, you know, just around um, with the chief of schools and you know what does the evidence what does the evidence-based practice say what does the research say I love that we're grounding our work in that um, and then just all across the board I just kept right like this is great this is great so um, so just thank you all for for all that you do and even with IT so those 12 student interns <laughs> um, are these CTE students and can we get a registered apprenticeship out of that to boot to get closer to that blueprint goal um, they are. They they are. Are. oh okay yes I love that so this has just been so encouraging. So um, just thank you all. So I'll just end it there. But next time you come, I'll pull up the okay. questions. <laughs> um, other questions or comments, Mr. Young? 
Miss Book of Dwyer took part of my question. <laughs> it's about, well, it's about the 12 um, students, and I know we have a information technology program, so is what they are doing as far as help desk, um, as far as the computer repair, is that also feeding into um, their classroom learning? Uh, e <clears throat> yes, because as I think someone mentioned, it is part of the CTE program. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, not only is it feeding into their um, educational objectives, what we also do during, and we did this during the summer intern, or during the summer uh, program, we do allow them to sit for certifications. So they can come out of our programs with the basic um, IT certifications, so A plus, um, certification for device repair. Um, so we're, we're, a lot of the, the students that are coming in, this is the first exposure to the IT field, but they're taking advantage of it, and if they want to pursue it, um, we're giving them the tools and the ability to get the certifications that make them more marketable. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Hen? So I'll add my wow to the list and echo my colleagues. Incredible work, incredible presentation, just truly amazing. And this is the first time it feels like we're on the path to making it easy for our stakeholders to engage with us. And that's the first time I felt this way. And that just affirms for me that we are moving in the right direction. And thank you all for your work. Website looks great, Ms. Boyenda. I, I could go through my list. I have you know as many items as Ms. Booker Dwyer. We'd be here all night. But um, it looks fantastic. The, the one thing, because I got to throw a, a to-do item in, or I wouldn't need to give you homework. Um, our HR, I was going to ask, is our HR section of the website for hiring our job postings on your list in terms of improving that process and website. I mean, what's out there is great, but seeing what you can do makes me think it can only be better. And with our goal of recruitment and retention, yes. yeah. Mr. McCall's shaking his yes. head. So <laughs> I love the collaboration. I love the teamwork. That, that's one potential partnership I see um, as really making a huge impact on staff, but we are here to serve. We're here to serve our schools, we're here to serve our families, and certainly our students, most importantly. And if there were one theme that I took from your, your presentation, it seems like everyone is laser focused on doing just that. So again, thank you. Okay, again, thank you all for that presentation. We just have one last piece to do, so you can just sit still if you want, and then, so, and then we'll all go home. So um, the next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting. Again, if anyone has any comments or agenda setting, um, I'll go around. I'll actually give Maggie Ms. Domenowski a break, and I'll start with Ms. Booker Dwyer. <laughs> any closing comments or agenda items? Uh, closing this I mean I just I'm still just kind of in um, at a loss of words for <laughs> for just this presentation so thank you all for that and I'm um, just for an agenda item when will the revised boundary policy come before the board like when are we going to actually get to the root cause of all the, these these boundary discussions so where so just to know where we are with that when it's going to come to the board okay yeah. thank you um, mr. McMillian Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Well, I didn't want to repeat my wow, but so I have something else. But I did want to say that also. But everybody else said what I wanted to say. Um, um, as budget season is beginning, in addition to the continuation of free breakfast and lunch in schools throughout the county, I'd like to discuss the possibility of working together with county officials to provide summer meal services outside of federal summer meals programs. Over the summer, meals were provided at 13 schools throughout the county as well as libraries. Um, however, students had to get transportation to the locations where meals were being served, um, along with the guardian, and they had to eat the meals on site as part of federal regulations, not as part, not part of um, BCPS regulations. Um, and this was f for both breakfast and lunch, so twice a day if they needed meals. Um, so this requirement hinders accessibility to our students who are in most need. Um, Data repeatedly shows a direct correlation between um, 
lower academic achievement as well as high risk youth behaviors and school attendance and lateness for students with food insecurities. So based on this data, the need to address food securities throughout the year fits with our moral imperative to ensure that we're supporting all students in achieving academic excuse me, success, especially considering we live in a, live in a county where at least 66% of our students are living in poverty. That's all. Thank you. Dr. Savoy? Ms. Drummond, do you have any um, closing comments or agenda items? I do not. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Hen? None for me, thanks. Have a good night, all. Thanks. Ms. Seleski? The optimism in this room is incredible. So, great start to the year. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Frumpong? Um. This may seem a little weird, but I really think we should give you guys a round of applause. <laughs> like, um, so thank you so much again. I think it's, it's just been very positive. The information we're hearing, um, I think that everyone is, is in alignment with what we are trying to do with the focus being on our students. Um, so I'll come back to what I said earlier as far as I was a little bit maybe premature with the agenda item. but since that decision has been made to um, close camp field that we kind of keep that on the radar as far as making sure we're communicating and um, informing the community students parents staff etc what is going on um, with that process um, as they are going to be moved back to um, their home schools but um, thank you guys thank you mr young i'm going to echo um thank you it was very informative. Um, I applaud Mr. Augusto also for his grow your own philosophy with uh, our CTE students. Um, thank you, Dr. Rogers, for your report of what it's taken to get us so far to this point of opening the schools. And I look forward to uh, great work from you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Domenowski? Again, thank you, everyone. Um, wonderful presentations. It was great to hear from all of you and all the hard work that you're doing. Uh, one thing I would like to, um, I know there was a lot of changes with the new bus routes adding to, from going from a mile to a mile and a half. A lot of emails have been going out. I've been getting them. You've been getting them. I know you've answered all, a lot of them and, um, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but I, I was wondering if we could do a presentation on how we are addressing all those issues so that, um, you know, uniformly we're telling all the public and so that they know that you've heard their concerns and you are working on them. Um, so we don't have to keep doing one-on-one -on -one email returns. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Thank you, Madam Chair. A, a few things I'd like to say. One is, is that the Chief of Schools presented on the book Districts That Succeed. And of the five uh, principles or things that we have to have in place to succeed, it says that one must be effective leaders. And when we have even three of the five, including effective leaders, that schools are 10 times more likely to succeed and to improve. And so we're on our way. Um, I cannot say how optimistic I am about the leadership of Dr. Rogers, the leadership of this team. So please uh, continue the work that you're doing. Use us as a board to give you the supports that you need. We're up for it and we're here for you. So thank you for that. I'd also like to say to the families and the staff and the teachers at Camp Field, uh, we had a hard decision to make. And I'm just acknowledging that it is a loss. It is a loss for you. And in addition to that, we understand that we have to recreate a nurturing, collaborative, supportive, and safe environment for some of our most vulnerable learners. And we are obligated to do so, and we are committed to extending our resources and our expertise to work purposefully and diligently to make sure that all of our students flourish in all of our schools. So I appreciate uh, that this is not a decision that, that you would have liked to have happen, but I want to reinforce that we are committed to making sure that the transition is smooth and positive uh, and vibrant for your families and your students. And the last thing I want to say is a big thank you to Mr. Hartlove 
and to Ms. Webster and to Contract Committee Vice Chair Young uh, for your dedication and your diligence in helping us to update the contract recommendation form. Um, I believe it is a great example of how we can uh, collaborate and be respectful and productive in our roles as uh, the board and governance and operations on the system side. So I appreciate your commitment to ensuring that we have what we need to make informed and considered decisions as we consider how we're spending money and in, in awarding contracts within the system. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. And I'd just like to thank the board members. Um, it's been a long night, and both in closed session and in open session, we had difficult decisions to make. But I really think that you, that we all asked really good questions and made comments to kind of push on each other and make each other think um, even more deeply about the things that we needed to vote on. So I thank you for your participation tonight and, and the homework that you did to get ready. And on that note, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday September 26 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned.